and um, we are going to call Mfundi today to lead us in devotion this morning. Mfundi is Ukanyiso to come forward uh, through Sacred Betty so that she can give us the word of God. She gives us the word of God and she will follow up with another session. Mfundi, you are welcome. Um, God bless you. Yes. Let us pray in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. You are God the Alpha, God the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord Christ Jesus, we come before your holy throne this morning to give thanks to you because you have proven yourself to be faithful yet again. When we woke up, Holy Father, we heard the birds sing. You were so gracious to us. You gave us our daily bread. As we're about to start this summit, we ask you to intervene. We ask the Holy Spirit to take control, to guide us, to help us. Lord Christ Jesus, I come before you as I'm about to talk about your word, as unworthy as I am, but this moment, Lord, I give unto you, take place, take control. All I ask in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let me take this opportunity to greet the bishop and other bishops that may be amongst us. I greet all the ministers, I greet all the leaders from different churches that are amongst us today and the congregation at large. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. But mostly, let me say to all the women that are here, Watinda Bafazi, Watindimbogojo, if it was not for this month, maybe I wouldn't be standing here but because there are women who gave up their life so that other women like us in the near future may be able to stand and get freedom. That's why in the city this morning to all the women that are here, power to the women, power. Our scripture reading for our devotions this morning will get it from the book of prophet Isaiah. Chapter, it's chapter 42. I'll only read one verse, which is verse 9. Isaiah, chapter 42. I'll read one verse, which is verse 9. The heading of the scripture is saying the servant of the Lord. Verse 9, I read as follows. See, the former things have taken place. And new things I declare, before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Amen. Our theme for the day is armed for the future. I received a correspondence from Umama Utuli Ngomonde 
telling me about the summit that the Methodist Church is doing and what it is about regarding the future of South Africa and definitely any other surrounding or nearby countries or neighboring countries. When Mama Tuli gave me this clip, I listened to it, Mama Tuli, and I listened that it was speaking about the near future. And we all know about 4IR, which is the fourth industrial revolution, which our president Ramaphosa wants us as the nation to look at. And as I prayed so hard so that God can give me the scripture to speak about the future and how we can go into it or how we can, yes, look forward to it. And, and as the church, how can we do that? This scripture that I read from Isaiah came to mind. When we talk about the future at times, we do not know how or what the future holds for us. But in most cases or in most times, we always, we always hope that the future is holding the best things for us. And in most cases, when God is saying, or oh, in any other, I would say, atmosphere or field, when something is going to be reinvented, when something is going to be developed or redeveloped, something had already taken place before. And yet, in most cases, there are some people who will have or who will be affected detrimentally by the change. But yet again, change has to happen. But what are we as the church we are saying? Because let us remember that we as the church, we are the voice. We are the eyes. We are the ears of God. So when change is about to happen, when something new is coming, we cannot keep quiet as the church because God made us the stewards on the earth and say, look after everything that is happening. So as the church, we have to say something. We cannot bury our heads in the sand as if nothing is happening. So I believe that God has sent me today to speak what God wants me to speak. When I read Isaiah chapter 42, I also noticed that it is the Lord our God that is speaking these words. It's actually the reminder that God is in control. God is in control about all, is in control of everything that is happening in the earth. From the beginning, as we all know that God was the word, and everything that came to exist, it existed because God said so. And when God looked around, God said, it is good. So as the church, as the nation, as the people of God, anything that is happening, we need to look at it and we need to say something as the church. God knows everything that happened before and things to happen. Let us remember, congregation, we are serving the Lord that is all-knowing. A God that is all seeing, the omnipresent and the omnipotent God. So that is why today I am reminding you that whatever the future may hold for us, let us not be afraid. Let us not get weary because our God is in control. And that reminded me of the Psalm 24. When King David wrote these words, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for God founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The change that we want to see in our country, it's not going to affect only the elite people it will also affect the people who are at the lower level of the economic ladder. But as the church, 
I would say we are in the advantageous part because we serve all these people. So that is why we need to have a word. We need to say something. God is for all, is, God is for all of us. Those will be affected negatively and those that will be affected in a positive way. And as the church, it's, it's, it's a hard part. I know that there are some people maybe who believe that secular and sacred do not mix. But unfortunately, I for one, it's a, a personal opinion. I believe in Fundisi. We, as the sacred, we need to see the things that are happening in the secular world. That is why even in the ages ago, God would appoint the prophets so that they are able to speak to what is happening in the nations. Because God cannot keep quiet, no matter what is happening in the world, whether it is right, it is wrong. But we are that prophetic voice. And as the church, we need to stand in truth. And if we look at the times of the Old Testament, we also noticed that when everything was about to happen, the prophets would have known about it and they would talk about it. And throughout generations after generations, there were prophets who were appointed to say something about anything that is happening in the world. And as the church, we are that prophetic voice. Let us remember also as the church, as the voice of God, that we cannot stand stagnant. Times are changing. So we are also need to change but not forgetting who we are, not forgetting the substance of the church or what we stand for as the church. And let us remember that anything that happens in the neighboring countries or globally, one way or another, that also affects us. That is the hard part. So the changes or the developments that are happening in the first world countries, whether as South Africa, we are the first and the third world country in the same country, but such changes, they do affect us. That reminded me, Fundisi, that at some point, when Israelites were ruled by the judges, and they looked around and they saw that other nations were not ruled by the judges. They were ruled by the kings. And that also had an attraction to them. And that they wanted that. But I'm not sure whether they thought deeply about the consequences of leaving the judges or leaving the way God appointed that these people, this is how they will live. They just looked at the nations, the way they lived, the way, they did, the way they did things, and they also wanted the same. And when uh, the judges, or when those that were appointed, the elders, so when the elders went to Samuel to ask Samuel, that Samuel, your sons are not doing right. We cannot be ruled by them. We also want kings to rule us. That disturbed Samuel. But because it is what people wanted, it had to happen. And Samuel did not just do it, or Samuel did not just, yeah, operated the, the, the request, but he had to speak to God first. And we as the church, that is what we need to do. We need to speak to God about everything and about anything. And let us remember that even by the times of the Old Testament, every king that was appointed, that king had his own weaknesses 
and that king had his own friends. If we remember, some of the kings were not so spiritual, but too economic. Those maybe that have done theology, they will remember the Omri dynasty. Those that looked after the infrastructure, those that looked after developing the countries and making money. But when King Josiah came into being, when it was his time to reign, he noticed that something was not right. The spiritual reformation needs to be done. So when we appoint the presidents, when we appoint people, let us know that, that not everyone has got the same strength and the same weaknesses. Others will, strength, will strengthen the other parts of economy, but the others will strengthen the other parts of the spirituality. And as the church, I believe we stand for the spirituality part. But any change, let us remember, it needs preparation as it has its own consequences. Let us ask us ourselves these three questions. How can we arm for such if we don't rely on God? Let us remember that we are God's people. God created and loved us deeply. And let us know that what affects us, it also affects God. As we prepare for the new things, let's put an armor as it is written in Ephesians chapter 6. Because as the church, we don't do the things as the world does things, but we do things in a spiritual way. So we need to put the armor that is stipulated or that is written down on Ephesians 6. Because without the help of the Holy Spirit that we were promised when Jesus Christ went up, he can do nothing. But the Holy Spirit was promised to be our comforter. It was promised to be our counselor. So that when we are faced with challenges in this life, we know where to go. When I close, I will say these few lines. One song can change a moment. One idea can change the world. One step can start a journey. One prayer can change this, the impossible now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Central Synod, I'd like to welcome you all here today uh, to this really, really important time uh, together. Uh, we as the church are, are faced with some really interesting challenges. Uh, but the exciting thing is this, is that we have the ability to be able to face those challenges <clears throat> and overcome the challenges. Um, I'm grateful that you have seen it as important to be here this morning to be able to look at some of the stuff uh, in which we can do church better. Uh, when Jesus said, uh, we must love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, a lot of us understand what it means to love God with all our heart. A lot of us understand what it means to love God with all our soul and all our strength. But what we haven't figured out is how do we love God with our mind? What did he mean by that? How do we love God with our mind? Well, part of what we're doing today is showing our love for God by increasing our thinking capacity. 
to come here today to learn more. We love God with our mind when we read books, when we study future uh, trends like you are today, when we apply our minds uh, to what it is we sense that God is saying um, to us. So thank you so much for being here today and for loving God with all your mind. Uh, it is my prayer that your mind will be stretched. Um, I, know, uh, I, know, I know this is going to be introducing Graham. I've known Graham for a very long time. Um, he's a friend, and I know without any doubt that he's going to change your thinking and your mindset on so many things. Um, and so we really are, um, really we have a gift in him coming to speak to us uh, today. Uh, a fellow Methodist. So, uh, friends, welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you're here, and I pray that today will be a really incredible, incredible time for you, and that you take what you learned today, and you're able to take it into into your learn, into your local church. God bless you. For such powerful opening and welcome done by our keynote speaker, Jerry Rivers. And official welcome is being done. Now everybody wants to know why are we here. But I think the message tried to unpack um, the way forward to say, even if you're my, in your mind you were doubting or asking yourself a few questions, why are we here? The message is that the world is changing and the world is moving. And as a church, we cannot be sitting in the olden days and not looking forward of what is coming. We are here to just open our mind. It's an open conversation. Uh, we hear the word uh, fourth industrial revolution. We're not sure how big this hoho is, but we are here to say, let's talk about it. Let's just unpack it. Let me understand it. And the nice thing is that we have a different mixed age group here. So younger people, middle-aged, elder people, that will say, when they talk this, where do, where do I fit in? What do I need to prepare? So that's a reason why we are actually here. But more than that, we had a call from the presiding bishop that said, the future is present, and the fourth industrial revolution, it's here. We cannot ignore it as a church, we need to open platforms and engage. It's really just about engaging to say, as I said, that how do we move from here? So without wasting more time, I will be calling Umfundusi to Anele Bono to come and do formal introduction of the speakers of the day. And try, let's try to write notes where you can. We are streaming live because we've been asked to say, what we're talking about, is it needs to benefit all. When I say all, I'm talking about all the churches all the individuals. So we are streaming live and um, through Grace Point uh, line so that everybody in the connection can actually benefit because it's not everybody who managed to make it here, but we cannot be selfish and lock ourselves in this little room and then nobody else hear the message. So that is why we'll be going live. So even in our conversation, we must remember that we've got people that will be sending messages or questions to say engage on this. Uh, because of the distance, but we welcome everybody. Mfundisi, over to you. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he that he gave us his son. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice, let the people rejoice, oh come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Thank you so much, Gusis Tuli, to the bishop um, of the, it's called Synod now. I come from the old church where we called it a district, so you will forgive me and, um, and everybody else who is here to 
be part of this initiative and the start of the new discourse in the, in the life of the Methodist Church. It gives me great pleasure to be the one who has been asked to introduce the speakers. And because I want to come back again, in case I don't get another opportunity, allow me to introduce one speaker at a time. Um, I understand this is live, so I want to be seen out there that I'm doing this. So if I introduce everybody now, then I would miss much more other opportunities to come and stand before you. Um, but this, this is very interesting times. And um, just before I introduce you, Graham, this, this time calls us to take away the box altogether. There's no thinking outside of the box. We destroy the box. We begin to think freely, um, widely, imagination crazy, and start a new revolution within the life of the church. Um, this time calls us to be the interpreters of time, as Jesus has called. We called to pause as the church and interpret the times um, so that we would shape the, the future today. Um, so this is your platform. Everybody is equal in this space. Um, and um, you, you, you share you more than anything else. We also are in a time where we are called to, to do a, a membership audit in the life of the church and allow people to be what they are in the world, in the church. If you are a doctor, we've got to create a space in the church that a doctor would be a doctor in the church. If you are a teacher, you teach. If you are a financer, you do your finances within the life of the church. So it is that time so that relevant people would do relevant work when are called to do so. Um, the bishop has already um, introduced Ugrem um, briefly, um, he is indeed a gift to us, and he, he comes exactly from this idea of the, of the membership audit. We have quality in the Methodist Church. Sorry, I'll speak about the Methodist Church. We have quality in the Methodist Church, but we've got to bring quality onto the fore and allow everybody to, to participate into the conversations of the Methodist Church. We, we've passed that time. I need to say these things. We've passed that time that we are going to be recycling people in the Methodist Church. We should pass that time. We must pass that time. We've got to bring in new, fresh ideas onto the table and that everybody, every member of the, of the Methodist Church would be free to contribute into the life and the, and the future of this church. Um, I've just lost the, the introduction. I wrote it down. <laughs> but I would remember certain things about Graham. Graham comes from the Melrose Methodist Church. Um, him and his wife are, are staunch members of the, of, the, of, the, of the Melrose Methodist Church and are true disciples into that church. He has asked me to be very much brief. He doesn't want to you know, to get all of these things to be said, to, you know, to be introduced with all of these things. His work will speak for itself as he continues to lead us into, into this conversation. He's a former, I don't know, no, he's not a former. He's an ordained minister of the Baptist Church. Um, ordination cannot be former or present. He is an ordained minister of the Baptist Church. He is a lay preacher now in the Melrose Methodist Church. Uh, Graham also holds a master's in theology. He, he holds a doctorate in the, in the study of business administration. And um, he is, works now currently as a strategist. And um, he is also a futurist, an influencer in the, in the life of the, of the, of the in, 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 his, in, his, in his life. And um, he's a gift, as Ugeri has already indicated. 
So please give him the ear, the spirit, discernment, and, um, and together we listen to him. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Graham Coddington. Thank you, Anile. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, great to be here this morning, and uh, it's really great to be kicking off this morning. We're going to hear from other speakers, as you've heard, uh, and Ellie will come back and introduce them all uh, in turn, uh, as later this morning we focus our attention specifically on the implications of change for our church's vision and finances. Uh, we, we've already heard uh, this morning in our devotion that we should not think of some aspects of our lives as secular and some aspects as spiritual, but to, to see the integration uh, between them. But we'll get back to that a little bit later. What I've been asked to do as we start this morning is to explain this concept of the fourth industrial revolution. The, uh, our, our bishop in the Methodist church, I know there's some people here not from Methodists, but our bishop in the Methodist church has talked about the church needing to embrace this concept of the fourth industrial revolution uh, and what that means for us. Basically, as we head into the 2020s, as we head into this decade that was really the, supposed to be the decade of the future, I, I don't know if, if you're like me, uh, I've always thought of the 2020s as the proper future. You know, you, you, we, we're always living in the present and the future's always coming. But I think when I wake up on the 1st of January and the calendar says 2020, I'm going to expect flying cars and also it does feel like that, right? doesn't feel like the 2020s is now. It feels like it's a long time in the future. For those of you who remember the movie Back to the Future, you remember that from the 1980s? Some of you are nodding, you, you're old like me. Um, but Back to the Future was a, uh, the second part of that series was... Uh, of, of Marty McFly going forward into the future. And if you remember the movie, you might remember which year he went to in the future. Uh, he came to a future where your shoes lace themselves and there's a hoverboard, uh, no wheels on your skateboard and so on. That future was 2015. So even back to the future is in our past. That's how far in the future we are already. And a few years ago, Bill Gates was asked, about what he thought the future would hold. Um, this was at a lecture that he did at the London School of Economics. And I'm gonna talk about change in the church from a business perspective for a little bit. This is what I do for a living, and I'll bring it back to the church. But I'm, I'm not gonna be embarrassed about using examples like great business leaders, uh, Bill Gates being one of them, because I think that business sees the future faster than the church sometimes. You know, if, the, if business doesn't see the future, their shareholders sell their shares, their customers walk away, and their business closes. When a church dies, it takes 30 years to die. When a business dies, it takes 30 weeks. So sometimes we need to look at a business and see what's being learned in a business because they see the crisis long before we see the crisis. We look at this meeting and we see nobody, well, I've got to be careful of the age of audience, but I don't see anybody under the age of 20 here. I see very few people under the age of 30. I see very few people under the age of 40. And I see that every time I look out at churches that I visit as a lay preacher, I see the same demographic. If you don't see the church is dying, you're not looking properly. You can look in your accounts and see the money coming into your church, and you can see another symptom of the church dying. And you can give all sorts of excuses you like to yourself, but if you were in business, you would be fired. So we can look to business for some lessons and then come back to the church and ask, what does this mean? But we have to understand that we're talking about the same thing, deep change that's hurting us. So five years ago at the London School of Economics, Bill Gates was asked a question about what he thought the 2020s would be like. And this was part of his answer. And the reason for this is that he argued that for the last 20 or 30 years, we have created building blocks of change. 
building blocks that we can use to change parts of the world. So we've created computers, and then we've made them smaller and cheaper and more accessible to the point where most people here today have got a supercomputer in their pocket. Okay? Then we've created the building block of the internet, and we've, we, we've got 3G and 4G and now LTE and 5G is coming soon, and we've got fiber and we've got connectivity. And we've created the building block of new materials in engineering, and we've created building block after building block. But what's going to happen in the 2020s is we are going to put all of those building blocks together, and we are going to see a decade of extraordinary change. I'll give you a simple example. Driverless cars. Okay, they are coming. It's not, it's not if driverless cars are possible. It's when will they be here because they will be here soon. And driverless cars bring together about seven or eight different technologies, from, from radar uh, to 5G interconnectivity. And they pull those together, and then the world changes. Imagine what your life will be like if all the cars are driverless. Not just one or two. If you drive home and the person next to you driving is sleeping, you look across and you have a bit of a, a shock. And then you realize, no, don't worry, they can sleep, their car is driverless. That's interesting and cute, but it doesn't change the world. When every car is driverless, then every car can speak to every other car. And there's an entire network of driverless cars that are all speaking to each other. In other words, there are no more accidents. Every car knows what every other car is doing. Safety goes from very low to very high in that scenario. We also don't have traffic jams anymore because all the cars know what every other car is trying to do and they all negotiate the best path home. Um, they don't need, they could, don't need lanes. They can drive in between each other. In fact, you can drive on the other side of the road if you need to. In other words, we can all drive like the taxis already drive except it will be safe, okay? It will actually work. MIT has done modeling of this. They say traffic's flow will increase by 72%. Imagine if it takes you an hour to get to work now, it'll take you 20 minutes with driverless cars. Um, also, safety will increase to 96%, which can't be a bad thing. So there's just one example in motor cars. But then think about it. If you, as a parent, have to get your children to school, you've either got to put them in an unsafe taxi and just pray that they're safe, or you've got to actually take them. But if there's a driverless car, you can put a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old in a car and let the car take it for you. The car can pick them up later. Picking up elderly relatives who maybe can't walk, and today they have to just sit at home. Now they can be out and, 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 and have a life. Uh, people who are disabled uh, can do this. <coughs> Driverless cars are going to change the world. And that's one of maybe a hundred examples that Bill Gates was using. And that is what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. So this label of the fourth industrial revolution is about deep, systems change that is coming because we've got new technologies. But what we need to do this morning as we talk about the fourth industrial revolution is make sure we know what it actually means. Every conference you go to in business, I see a, a few friends I know here, some from the business world, every single conference you've been to in the last year has had a fourth industrial revolution workshop. It's becoming one of those cliches. In fact, there might even be people who chose not to come this morning because they said, oh, not another fourth industrial revolution talk. My question to those people who say, I've heard enough of the fourth industrial revolution, I have a very simple question for them. What was the second one? If you don't know what the second industrial revolution was, then don't tell me you're tired of the fourth one yet. Okay, we have to understand this label uh, for it to make sense. So a quick history lesson, although I was introduced as a futurist, I spend most of my time reading history textbooks. 
uh, because we must learn from the past so we can change for the future. So, quick history lesson so we understand what's going on now in the 2020s. The first industrial revolution began with that machine that's up there. It was invented by an Englishman called Thomas Newcomen in 1712. And it was a steam-driven pump that was used to turn a, a, a big wheel. Uh, in fact, somebody's recreated this uh, uh, recently so that we can see how it works. And this piston goes down, and it was into a coal mine, and it was used to bring water out of a Welsh coal mine. That allowed the miners in that coal mine to dig deeper and faster and get more coal out of the mine than they had before. This Industrial Revolution, we know this. This is the one we learned at school. This is the one we, we remember from our history. Uh, we often just call it the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but it was the first one. Because these machines, steam-driven and then coal-fired and then petrol and diesel and gas and all the rest, these machines could do way more than human power could do. And they moved into every single industry from textiles to printing, from uh, vehicles and, and, and locomotion um, through to medicine. We put machines in every part of the world. And by the middle of the 1800s, every single industry in every part of the world was industrialized or industrializing. So then along came the second industrial revolution. Towards the middle and, and later parts of the 1800s, we had reached a point where the machines were doing everything the machines could do. But life was not great. Uh, these factories were dirty. They were horrible places to work. People didn't like them. Um, the, the, the world was not getting any more productivity now. We had reached as much productivity as we could get with these machines. And a few clever business people came along and said, hang on, we've got to think differently here. And the second industrial revolution wasn't a revolution of new technology. It was a revolution of taking the technologies that we had invented, these big machines, and completely reimagining how we worked. So what we did with those machines. That, let, let me give you an example. I um, hope this makes sense. <coughs> so let's say we're making bottled water, right? In the old way, we would take one person would have the bottle. They'd fill the bottle with water. They'd put the lid on the bottle. They'd put the label on the bottle. And they'd put the bottle in a box to be sent to the shop to, for sale. Then they'd turn, they'd take another bottle, they'd fill it with water, they'd put the lid on, they'd put the label on, they'd put it in the box. Now let's say they could do 10 of those an hour, just for, for random numbers. What we did with the machines, the first industrial revolution was to say, can machines do any part of that? Okay? And we said, yeah, we, we can get a machine that will fill the bottle, we can get a machine that will screw a lid on, we can get a machine that will put the stickers on, and we can get a machine that drops it in the box. So we don't need any humans in the system. We've just got these machines, and that machine can maybe do a hundred of these in an hour. And if that's what you want to do, and you get rid of the people from, from the system, that's fine. And that works if every single bottle you're making is entirely the same. But what happens if this is handcrafted? It's got somebody's name on it, or it's got a special logo, or each bottle is a slightly different size. You want something that's individual and unique. Well, then we have to rethink this process. The machines can't do that for us. We need a human being in the system. And along came a few clever people thinking about how the world works, and they said, you know what? Don't do it the way you were doing it. Here's what you should do. One person should fill the bottles with water and then pass them on. Then one person should screw the lids on. Then one person should put the labels on and then another person should put them in the box. And when you specialize like that, when each person does one thing in the system, 
And that's their only thing to do. They get to do it perfectly. They become an expert in that thing. They can do it faster. They can do it better with better quality. And the overall quality improves. Now, some of those can be machines, but some of those need to be people. The person who perfected this was Henry Ford. Uh, sorry, let's go back to that there. So Henry Ford, in his motor vehicle factory, said, Machines can do some things. People must do other things. We have to combine these together. And then we have to change the way we build a car. Each person must only do one thing. If your job is to put the front left wheel on, then that's the only thing you do. You put that wheel on, you turn the wheel, nuts, you stand back, you wait for the next car. You put the wheel on, you turn the nuts, and the car moves past you. You don't move. It was called a continuous production line. You can see it there in that video. By the time Henry Ford perfected this in 1922, his factories were producing one car every 32 seconds. Okay? In fact, the last uh, person on the production line was a driver. He had to jump in the car and drive the car out of the factory. He had 32 seconds to do it. Otherwise, the next car came and crashed in behind him. That's this, just this line didn't stop. It kept going. It improved productivity dramatically. It increased our ability to build things. Uh, it built the world as we know it today. But here's the important piece, and if you're taking notes, this is the sentence you need to remember. The second industrial revolution did not invent any new technologies. It took the technologies of the first industrial revolution and reimagined how we could work. So it, it, it turned things, put things in different orders. It, it changed the way that we thought about work. It said you don't have to be a generalist, you must be an, an expert, a specialist. Uh, another thing, it wasn't just technology. Henry Ford, for example, one day on a weekend, he was thinking and saying, how do we get more people to buy our cars? We're making one car every 32 seconds. We have to find customers for these cars. And he said, well, can the people who are building the cars, can they afford to buy a car? So he went into the office on Monday. He asked his accountants, how much money do you have to earn in order to buy a car? They did the maths and they got a calculation. And then he said, how much do people in our factories work? And he discovered that nobody who was building a car could afford one. In fact, they would have to double their wages to afford a car. So he said to his accountants, double everybody's wages. They literally did it in one day. His accountants freaked out. You can imagine that uh, leadership meeting, eh? Let's double the wages. No, you can't do that. But he was very clever. He doubled the wages, but he gave people the option to use some of their wages to buy cars. So he created his own market, and a lot of his staff did that. Um, he changed the market. Imagine he wasn't struggling to find talented people to come and work for him uh, with that kind of attitude. Now, I'm not saying he was the nicest guy ever, it was a complete calculation, but he wasn't scared to change everything because his focus was on saying, we now have all of these technologies. If we were building our business from today without our legacy and our history and all of our built-in rules and systems and structures, given the technologies that exist today, how would we build this thing? That was the attitude that the second industrial revolution brought. Now, remember that attitude because in about two minutes, you're going to need it. Because we now move to the third industrial revolution. What was the third industrial revolution? Okay, digital, electricity was part of it. Electricity began it earlier on, and then it became digital. Exactly. This is the computing revolution uh, that came with our, our computer processes, 
uh, came with then mainframes and then desktops and then laptops and now handheld computers. It's the internet and connectivity, um, all of the things that we know of the, of the digital age. So what's the fourth industrial revolution? Okay, but the, the third industrial revolution is technology, is digital technology. Ah, I told you two minutes ago that there was a sentence I gave you that you might need again. If you were taking notes, you can just read it back to me now because this is why an understanding of history is important. This is why if you want to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, you must understand what the second one was. The first industrial revolution was new technologies, factory technologies. The second industrial rev revolution was using those factory technologies to completely change the way we worked. So if the third industrial revolution is digital technologies, including all of the technologies that will uh, uh, include artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, automation, all these big words, those are all third industrial revolution. Those are all technologies. If you don't do anything with the technology, it's not going to help you, is it? It hasn't changed the world yet. The fact that you can get emails on your phone doesn't make it easier to deal with emails. It just means your boss expects to find you everywhere. <laughs> not any time. Not just office hours, not just in your office. So has emails on your phone made things better or worse? Be honest, it's worse. It's worse. And then you go, oh, Graham, but what about WhatsApp? And we get to WhatsApp. Do you know the curse, the modern curse? This curse should be in the Bible somewhere. We should be able to find this in Jeremiah. The curse is the double blue tick. I know you've read my message, but why are you not responding? That double blue tick is a curse. If you disable your, exactly, some of you know how to disable that. The technology is not the fourth industrial revolution. That's just the third. The fourth industrial revolution says, look at all of these technologies. Now what must we do? How must this change us? How can this change us? How can it change us in bad ways? Let's try and protect ourselves from that. You know, that's why we tell people to switch off their phones before a church service. Let's not interrupt our worship with the sound of an Apple ringtone. But if we only have the attitude of how do we keep this technology out, we're, we're not learning anything. We're not progressing. We're not embracing the gift that that technology can be. So when the bishop says we must embrace the fourth industrial revolution, he's using a shorthand. He's using a code which says this. We now live in a digital world full of technology, some of which will be damaging to us as people and some of which can release us into a, into a bright new future. As a church, as people, as people of God, how do we use this technology? How do we take what's happened in the last 30 or 40 years in the development of these technologies, and how do we use these technologies now to reimagine what church and our lives and our communities might look like in the 2020s and beyond? That's a long thing to say, so that's why he just says, let's embrace the fourth industrial revolution. But that's actually what he means, that there is a lot for us to do. So our task today at this conference is 
to say, well, what does this actually look like? It's one thing to say that. It's one thing to say we need to reimagine what a church might look like in the digital age, but how do we do it? So what I want to do is I want to give you some principles, the principles on which the fourth industrial revolution is based. Now, these are business principles, and I haven't specifically changed my language. So if I do a workshop for a big uh, business, uh, this is the type of stuff I will talk to them about. But I want you to begin thinking, what does this mean for the church? We will have that conversation uh, in a few minutes. So there are three key, I'm not even sure if principles is the right word. There are three key foundations, three key pillars on which the fourth industrial revolution is built. There, there they are there in that, in that slide. The first is data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. I will explain all of these uh, in detail. But for me, that's the starting point. The starting point is that we live in an era when we can know something. You know, when I was growing up, you know, someone would, we'd, we'd be playing as, as, as children, and someone, we'd, 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 we'd go inside, we'd, we'd make a peanut butter sandwich, and, and one of us would say, I wonder who invented peanut butter. And we'd all look at each other and go, wow, he must have been a clever guy. Maybe it was a woman, I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. Nobody knows. And then we would go on with our lives. Because how on earth would you find out who invented peanut butter? I'm talking 20, 30 years ago when I was growing up. Maybe one of us, I was normally this friend. This is the way my mind works. When that question then sticks in my head, I think I can't sleep. I, that question stays with me for days. So maybe I will find myself near a library somewhere. And I'll go into the library and I'll ask the librarian, do you have an encyclopedia? Do you have a, a book on the history of inventions? Do you have a book on peanut butter? And I'd go and find out. And then a few days later, maybe if I remembered, I could tell my friends I have an answer. But by then they've moved on. Who's, who cares? Today, if I, has anybody found out who invented peanut butter while I'm sitting here? No, it wasn't Black Cat. It wasn't Black Cat. Now, this is the difference between a whole group of old people and a group of young people. I promise you, if I was giving this example and we had a whole lot of millennial young people, half of the room would have already Googled it. Half of, somebody's saying there, have you found out? A, a man called Edson, not Edison. Wouldn't it be cool if the guy invented the light bulb, also invented peanut butter? But that's Thomas Edison. This is a guy called Edson. Uh, uh, it's Gilbert, isn't it? Gilmore. Gilmore Edson. And it was in 1880 something or other. There we go. Now people are finding out. You see, we live in a world where if you, somebody asks you a question and you say, I don't know, you now have a choice. Immediately in the moment, you can now choose to find out or choose to not to. This is the first time in the history of the world this power exists for us as human beings. But now, Marutis, when you preach and you say, the Bible says, anybody under the age of 30 is saying, are you sure? <laughs> they are checking you. Now, according to Acts, where the Berean Christians were told that they were remarkable Christians because they checked everything Paul said. They didn't just believe him. They went and checked him, and then they came back the next day and said, but Paul, you said, but. So here's your first church lesson of the fourth industrial revolution. Expect to be tested in your preaching, in the moment. By the way, you should 
create those opportunities in your sermon. Say, I have a question for you. I'm going to wait. You can do some Googling because I want the answer. Not just the answer from Sunday school. I want the answer from the truth. Now, of course, Google's not always the truth. So we have to teach people that lesson. That's a whole other story about fake news and everything else. But why wouldn't your sermons be more interactive in the fourth industrial revolution? I'll tell you why. Because for a pastor, for a reverend, you now have to give up your arrogance that I am the only person in this sanctuary who knows theology. Because everybody now has access. And some of you are saying, ah, oh, but that's dangerous. So teach them. So teach them how to use this device. So that when they are at work, when they are walking, when they are lying down, are you hearing scripture? When they are in their way, they are able to have an answer for every question that every person asks them. Is that not really our job? as preachers. Our job is not to show off our knowledge once or twice a week. Our job is to train everybody else to be able to use the knowledge they now have. 20 years ago, they had to come to you because you were the one who knew. You were Google. You were Bible Google. Now you are not. This is huge, people. If you're understanding this, you should be nearly fainting if you are a pastor. Because I am starting with the biggest thing for you as a pastor. I am taking away the biggest thing you think you've got. As my first point, I'm only warming up. <laughs> it's going to get more serious from here. But this issue of knowing, having information, data analytics, then we add artificial intelligence on top of that. Artificial intelligence is about allowing machines to begin to think and to know and to come up with information, not just answering our questions. This is where Google is now. I visited Google's campus a few years ago, and they say, we've spent the last 15 years trying to answer people's questions. The next 15 years is to try and work out what the questions should be before you even ask. A, a real, real life example. Google is one of the best global health databases because as soon as people feel they're getting flu, they go to Google to search for the symptoms. And as soon as Google see, because they know, Google knows where you live, right? You know that. If you do a Google search right now, Google knows you sitting at Grace Point. So Google knows there's a conference now, and they, they think the conference is about peanut butter. <laughs> because that's what's happened in the last 10 minutes. There's a whole lot of people just Googled peanut butter at Grace Point. They don't know what's going on here. Okay. But maybe they'll check the live stream and, and work it out. But they know where you live, and so if a whole lot of people in your suburb, in your township, Google symptoms for flu, Google flags that and says, we think there's a flu problem going on there. Now, wouldn't it be great if Google sent you a message in advance? So if, if we are using this, this data, we've got our Fitbits, if, if you've got a, a fitness tracker, um, and, and we've, we've got the Google searches, and Google puts all of this information together, and it becomes predictive. So you get a message saying, you are going to get flu. <laughs> Truly next Wednesday, if you don't look after yourself now, by next Wednesday, you will have flu. Please look after yourself. Do this, do this, do this. Of course, Tully Google and Fitbit and your doctor knows your whole history as well. They know whether you normally get flu or don't get flu. 
They know where you've been. Now, I'm saying I think this is a good thing. I don't think it's good that everybody knows where I am and that everybody knows what I'm thinking all the time, but I don't mind if my doctor does. If my doctor is prepared to be predictive, so I don't want to only go to my doctor when I'm already sick. The future of the doctor, the doctor in the fourth industrial revolution, is a doctor who doesn't wait for you to get sick, is a doctor who phones you before you get sick. Because he or she is watching the Fitbit data, is watching what's going on in your community, knows your genetics, then this doctor becomes preventative. In fact, I think that we should stop paying our doctors. Have you thought about this? When you go to visit the doctor, right, you're very sick. You can hear I've got a bit of a sore throat at the moment. I've got some medicine from the doctor. When I visited the doctor uh, last week, when I was finished with the doctor, he said to me, see you soon. I looked at him and said, I hope not. The whole point is I never want to see you again. That would be my best life if I never, ever saw you again. Do you know that your doctor has no financial incentive to make you well? Have you ever thought about that? Some of you, this is the first time you're thinking about that and your whole life has just changed. Your doctor has no financial incentive to make you well. You know this is true because about one in every four times the pills don't work, you have to go back again. The doctor doesn't even say sorry. They charge you again and give you different pills. I'm not saying they do it deliberately. Of course, I'm not saying that. But wouldn't a better system be if we paid our doctors only when we were well? And when we stopped being well, we stopped paying them. That, my friends, would be a health care system. Right now, we have a sick care system. By the way, for the rich white people in the audience, that's also NHI. Yeah. So let's just have the right conversation about the right things at the right time. Okay. But now I'm really stirring. Okay. Let's leave that comment to the side. Okay. The other thing that you want here is you want this medical advice to be completely personalized. I don't want a doctor walking through the community just handing out antibiotics to everyone. I want them to say, Tuli, I know you. I know your genetic code. So here is some personalized medication for you. Not seven days of antibiotics, finish the course. Those antibiotics, they're big pills because they're big bombs. (laughs) Just bomb your whole system. No, no, no. We'll personalize for you because we know you. And then when we go to health insurance, and NHI is part of this, we pool the risk differently. Those of you in the insurance world understand this. How does insurance work when we know what's going to happen? When we know who will get cancer and who won't get cancer. When we know who will get flu and who won't get flu, because we know your details, we know your data. Can you see how this whole Fourth Industrial Revolution is going to change the health industry. Health insurance is going to become about prevention consultants. Insurance is going to become about prevention. We don't just wait until you've had an accident and then pay you out for your car. We stop the accident before it happens. Because we've got data. If all the cars are fitted with chips, We can see what's going on. We can see the car that you can't see that's coming fast. Doesn't look like it's going to stop at the traffic light. So we stop you so that that one can go through the red light. But you don't get killed because if everything is in the system, if all the data is known, then the system can look after us. Now, of course, the system can do bad things as well. We must accept that that can happen. I'm hoping we can believe that the system will do good things as well. And that's the peace that we want. So the first principle of the fourth industrial revolution is data, information, knowing people, knowing personal details about people, and then using that information to personalize 
our response. I've given you medical examples, and I've given you transport examples. I'm wanting your brain to start thinking of church examples. Okay? What would we do if we ministered to people on the basis of knowing them deeply and personalizing our ministry for them? This is the, and now I'm going to get into trouble, I know, but I'm not scared. This is the opposite of putting everybody into uniforms so they all look the same. Ah, yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. now you're going there. I'm going to run away from that comment quite quickly, but I'm going to come back to Wesley Guild and Maniano. Okay, I'm coming back. I'm just give, that was a warning, a warning that we are going there today. Okay, right, let's talk about personalization. Personalization is vital. You are an individual. In a church conference, I can say this. You are made in the image of God. And there is nobody like you that has ever been or will ever be. There's a theological depth to that statement, and there is a psychological depth to that statement. That's the deepest part of what it means to be me, is that I am the only me. We know that personalization works. The greatest marketing campaign of all time, it's proved that the money flowed, was based on personalization. It was this one. Coca-Cola put your name on a bottle and a can. There are some of you who never drink Coke. You have never drunk Coke. You will not drink Coke. But you have a Coke or a Coke bottle. Now, I realize in Africa, some of your names didn't make it onto Coke cans. Okay, sorry about that. Um, my weird spelling of Graham never made it onto Coke cans either. There, was a, there were a few places where you could go and give them your name, and they would put it on. And people queued for hours to get their name. These Coke cans of people who will never drink the Coke, they sit on their desk, in display, because of their name. When we personalize, we empower people. People feel known, they feel connected. We know this. Many of you are really good at being pastors because you know people's names. That's why we greet them at the door. We, we ask them about their children. We remember the information they told us last month, and we ask them, are you better now? How did that exam go? This is very much part of what it means to be a good pastor, is to be individualized in your attention. In, in the business world, in fact, let me go to this. In, in the business world, we, uh, we talk about it this way. We talk about disruption and technology being a disruptor. And some people say that technology gets in the way of, of us uh, personalizing. Um, I'm just a little bit nervous. I haven't, let me just raise my volume there. Uh, Kyle, I'm about to show a video and I'm not sure if I've raised my volume. I think we're okay. Let's see what happens. Technology is not the disruptor. Technology can be used to help us connect. Technology can be used to help us disconnect. There are some people through Facebook and Instagram who are connected to hundreds of people around the world, but disconnected from the person opposite them at the table. It's not the technology that's doing the, dis the, the disconnection. It's us, us as people. Hi, I just want to make a deposit. Do you have your account number? Right here. Lean forward, please. Hmm? Ah, ah, ah. What is this? It's our new customer tracking system. It has your account number and barcode. It speeds you right through the line. Now what? That line over there. I feel like banks are getting a bit impersonal. What's a hold up? when these things don't scan. <laughs> so let me give you another simple example here of how you personalize in the digital world, what the fourth industrial revolution allows us to do. What we don't want is to simply take the old ways we were doing things and then put them in the digital world. So for example, you want to open a bank account. 
you have to go to the bank, you have to fill out all the forms uh, to fill them out. I had to do this for my business a, l a little while ago. I had to open up a new bank account. I've been banking with this bank for 20 years. I have another business account for them with them that I've had for 17 years. But now I wanted a new account and they gave me a blank form like they didn't know me. The same form they give to somebody who just walks off the street they've never met. The first question, what is your name? It's like, we've known each other for 20 years. How can you not know my name? Then, of course, they say, no, 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 no. We don't need the form anymore. We've, we've gone digital. What does that mean? You've put your form on a web page, but it's the same form. The first question is still, what is your name? In fact, when you fill it out online, they even ask you, which bank do you bank with? <laughs> what the fourth industrial revolution says is this, I know you. There is information about you all over the place. In fact, all I need is your face. Did you, did you know that FNB can do this? H have a look at this. FNB introduces Switch with a Selfie. The newest, fastest, paperless, and most advanced way to open a bank account. Now, individuals or single business owners with a smartphone can switch to FNB just by taking a selfie. This means less paperwork, queues, and more ease, more convenience, more innovation. All done on the FNB app. State of the art biometrics verifies your details with the Department of Home Affairs. The in-app messaging system helps track your account opening progress. Select the product best suited to you and set up a digital banking profile. Location tracking will verify your address. Choose a card delivery method, date and time with the in-app calendar. Accept the paperless legal agreement. FNB, another first for innovation, another first for technology. Now your personal or business account opening process can be seamless, effortless, and hassle-free on the FNB app. This is exponential helpfulness, and this is just the beginning. How can we help you? So the question now for us as the church is, what value can we add? Some of you I know are a little bit nervous at the moment. You're thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. If everybody knows everything about me, what's going to happen next? I don't want all of that information out there. And you'll say, but what about POPI, Protection of Personal Information Act? What about GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations of the European Union? Well, all of those regulations simply say the following. They don't say you can't get people's data. They don't say you're not allowed to keep that data and do stuff with them. All they say is, if you are using somebody's data, you must tell them you are using it. You must tell them what you are using it for. And if they say no, then you have to stop. It's as simple as that. So all those phone calls you get of people trying to sell you stuff, if you say you don't want those phone calls, they should stop. So that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to protect you from your data being used incorrectly. But isn't it going to be wonderful to get your doctor telling you when you are going to be sick? Isn't it going to be wonderful to have driverless cars? Isn't it going to be wonderful? Imagine every time you opened your fridge, everything you wanted was already there. Because your fridge knew when it was empty and ordered the groceries to be delivered. That's the fourth industrial revolution thinking. The question needs to be for us as the church, what is the value that people want from us? What value do people want from us? Some of it is very simple value. They want their children to be dedicated and baptized. They want to be married. They want their mother to be buried. We know this. In, in the Baptist world, we used to call it hatches, matches, and dispatches. <laughs> Births, marriages, and deaths. Okay. This is something we do for our community. Our community wants more than that, though. They want spiritual growth. 
and guidance. They want development. And that must happen at an individual level. Enough with one-size-fits-all courses. Enough with group therapy sessions. Individual. Because we can. We can get to know people. The way we've done that in the past is we've kept our churches small. So there's only 50 people, we can know all of them. You don't have to do that anymore. We've got data. We've got devices. We've got spreadsheets. We've got databases that we can use. I'm just giving you examples. I'm not giving you a strategy. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you examples of the type of thinking. What do people want and how can we personalize for them because we know what they want? Maybe we should be asking people what they want. Maybe we can just do an online survey of our church members. Data. Okay. The second principle that we base the fourth industrial revolution on if the first principle is about data analytics and machine learning that leads to personalization and insights, the second is about cloud computing that leads to mobility and platform thinking. Whew, lots of words there. Cloud, cloud mobility, the only thing you need to know about cloud is, is that it's in your phone. Now, it, it, it basically it means we don't have to know the technology behind cloud computing to just know it's about being mobile, okay? about making sure that all of the information is always available wherever you are. And if it's on one device, it's on all your devices. Okay? So from a church conference perspective, it really is about two things. It's about are you connecting to people in their mobile devices? We, we know that everybody has got these devices. Whether you've got a very fancy smartphone or just a normal feature phone, we've got these devices with us. And we use them a lot. Again, maybe an older audience, you don't use them as much as the younger audience. But I see at least half the people here have got devices open right now. Um, and that's fine, because that's the world that we live in. Um, these devices are less, than 20, are, are less than an arm's length away 24-7, right? For some of you, this is what woke you up this morning, right? First thing you saw this morning. Beep, 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 beep. First thing you did this morning. If you had left this at home, would you have gone back for it? That would have been a nightmare if you suddenly realized, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then, tonight, this will still be the last thing you see. Even if there's a partner in the bed next to you. It's good night on this side. Quick, quick few examples. I travel regularly internationally. I buy my airline tickets on that device. I get my boarding pass on that device. I go through international passport control on that device in some countries. We're getting that soon, by the way. South Africa is going to upgrade very, very quickly to e-visas. Um, I was at a conference recently with one of the biggest banks in the UK, the Royal Bank of Scotland. And the CEO asked us, which do you think is our busiest bank branch? We guessed a branch in London somewhere. He said, no, it's the commuter train, the 701 train from Reading to London Central. It says hundreds of people access their banking app between 7 and 8 in the morning while they're on public transport. I think that would probably be true in South Africa. In some cases, in the taxi on the way to work. They are doing my banking. So then the question has to be asked, do you have to have a call center open at 7 o'clock in the morning? Yes, you do, because that's your busiest branch. If your customers are sitting there trying to access, they've got a problem with their account, and it's 7.06 in the morning, and they can't get help, and the help says, we'll be ready to help you at 8.30. They'll say, maybe there's another bank that's open at the time I'm open, because I'm open now. So let's make this about church again. Are you doing counseling via WhatsApp? Some of you are. I've got a friend who's a youth pastor. He does amazing work, especially with young teenage boys who are feeling 
uh, tempted by porn and things online. And he says to them, you have my WhatsApp number. When you feel tempted, before you do anything, WhatsApp me and say, help me, pastor. And then he apps them back and he says, I'm here, be strong. He says like that, he's helped young people break the cycle because they know there's somebody who can be there for them. 24-7, he can walk alongside young people who need somebody to be there for them. Now, you might think as a 55-year-old, yeah, but WhatsApp being there is not the same as real world being there. And you would be wrong. The digital world is real for young people. And the real world is digital. They have some friends. I have three teenage daughters and they have friends they have never met in real life. But they are deep friends from all over the world because they meet in the digital world. The next piece is, is probably a step too far uh, for church. Um, it, it might be for some of the bigger churches. In the business world, we talk about building platforms. This is about openness. I'll come back to this point after our break, which will take in a few minutes. Uh, but in the business world, the, the businesses that are succeeding are not businesses that are closing off and trying to protect their space. They are businesses that are opening up. Amazon, most successful company in the world at the moment, created the richest man in the world because of it. Anybody can sell anything to anyone on their platform. They're not saying we are a shop and we sell what we want to sell. They say, do you want to sell to you? No problem. We'll help you do it. They open, not closed. They connect and collaborate, not protect uh, and, 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 and pull in. Right, the final piece of the puzzle is this automation piece. This is probably when people think about um, the, the, the fourth industrial revolution, they think about automation, machines being able to do things that we can do. And of course, your best example of this is that machines can actually talk to us now and talk for us. Last year, uh, Google released a little program called Google Assistant, and Google Assistant's primary job is to manage your diary. But when you need to do something, uh, well, then I'll let the CEO of Google explain. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service, she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Isn't that unbelievable? That technology exists in your Android phone already, okay? Because it's in the cloud. So that automation is coming. Let me show you another example. Amazon, so we've talked about them already, they released a product called the Amazon Echo or the Amazon Alexa. And I've got one here with me. Um, so the, the cables here is just a power cable and, and a sound cable so that we can uh, get this uh, through the speakers. Yeah, thanks, Carl, we're up there. Um, and then I've just connected to the church Wi-Fi, which, to be honest, is very slow. 
Um, I, I hope... I hope you haven't all connected to the Grace Point public Wi-Fi as well, because then we're going to struggle. Uh, let me just check here. Alexa, are you connected to the internet? I am connected to the internet. Okay. Everything I'm about to do here is live, right? So there's nothing pre-recorded or anything. This is a little device that's connected to the internet. And when I say Alexa, at the moment I've muted her, when I say Alexa, she switches on and listens to me. And I'm just going to speak in my normal voice. You've been listening to me for an hour already. I'm not going to change my voice or anything. Just going to ask her any questions. I want to. I mean, she can do simple things like, Alexa, multiply 1,872 by 515. 1,872 times 515 is 964,080. Is that right, Craig? <laughs> yeah, or Alexa... Uh, when will Manchester United play again? Manchester United will play in the Premier League later today at 1.30 p.m. away against Southampton. Would you like me to remind you before it starts? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't. I, sorry, I'm, I'm seriously, at, at the moment, uh, I'm a Kaiser Chiefs and Manchester United supporter. My life is a misery. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> For those of you who know sport, that was a pretty cool answer, hey? Because it could have just said, now, by the way, the only reason I asked Manchester United is Amazon is not in South Africa yet, so you can't ask about Kaiser Chiefs or Pirates because it doesn't have the data. So this is international data. Um, so this I bought in the UK, um, and so it it's, it's sent, it's, lives in London. It thinks it's living in London. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had to trick it to bring it to Joburg. Amazon are coming to South Africa next year, so we will have access to these next year in South Africa. But I can ask uh, Alexa, what is the weather in Johannesburg tomorrow? Here's the forecast for tomorrow in Johannesburg, South Africa. Look for lots of sun with a high of 22 degrees Celsius and a low of 6 degrees. Okay. Again, nice level of detail, right? And it's just listening to my normal voice. Uh, this thing can read books to us. Um, it can play music. It, any piece of music that's ever been written is in here. You can just ask it to play it. Here's where Amazon are going. Why would Amazon produce something like that? Because what Amazon wants us to do in the future is to say, um, Alexa, I need to go to Cape Town on Friday for business. Please book my flights. Alexa, I'm having a dinner tomorrow with some friends. I want to cook. Uh, let me show you here. Um, Alexa, give me a recipe for lamb curry. Okay. For lamb curry, I recommend the top recipe called lamb curry, which takes three hours to make. You can ask for more information or for more recipes, say next. Uh, more information? Okay. I recommend the top recipe called Raspberry Molten Chocolate Cupcakes, What's which takes 25 minutes Alexa, to make. Alexa, stop. Okay, something went wrong with that. With no changing to anyway, that sounded better than lamb curry. I'll be honest. But but what she would do next is she would give me the recipe with the ingredients, and then take me step by step through it. Now, what I could do then is to say to Alexa, Alexa, please buy the ingredients have them delivered to my house. That's why Amazon is interested in this, because of the, the purchasing that goes behind it. But this is what's going to happen to us now. This is what automation means. It doesn't mean the robots are coming to our offices and our churches. That picture is incorrect. I like to think of, instead of artificial intelligence, I like to think of intelligent assistance, that we will get intelligence assistance. This loops around again to what I was saying about people knowing and not knowing, people using their devices to test you and check you, and using artificial intelligence to automate the world around us. So now we have to ask a question. How will we use artificial intelligence 
intelligent assistance. Um, how will we use data, data analytics? How will we use the principles of the fourth industrial revolution to completely reimagine what we might be doing at church? What I'd like you to do is to turn to the person next to you or two or three people that you seated next to. And I just want you to just brainstorm and one of you take some notes. What are three things that the church is invited to reimagine because of the fourth industrial revolution? Our Methodist bishop has said, we must embrace the fourth industrial revolution it is an invitation to reimagine church. What, what is in your mind at the moment is what I'm asking. What are some areas of the church? I've given you about five examples uh, already, but what's in your mind? What do you think are the biggest implications that you've thought of or can think of right now that is data, analytics, knowing, uh, investigation, use of devices, being mobile, being in your phone, being digital. Top three things. Quick conversation with the people near you. We'll take a break in about five minutes. Let me just interrupt you for a second. Some of you need a little bit of help. We don't want this, right? Can you see that picture? That's the Last Supper with all the disciples on their phones. Okay. Some of you, some of you are nervous of the fourth industrial revolution. Okay? You're saying, hang on, hang on, things can go wrong here. So part of our conversation must be how do we protect ourselves from the unwanted interruption and damage of some that is part of the conversation but don't get stuck on that part okay because there is a, a wonderful side to this as well um, and and here let's remind ourselves of some of the pillars uh, that we have of our church spirituality there's development and economic empowerment uh, there's evangelism and church growth right there's education and Christian formation there's justice, service, reconciliation. These are the pillars that we build our churches on. In what ways can the fourth industrial revolution help us enhance these pillars um, and, and grow these pillars? As a trainer and an educator, my mind goes to that pillar most often. We should be putting some of our courses, our church growth courses online. You know, I, I went and did a, a search for an introduction to the Bible. There really aren't good ones available. And there are certainly no South African ones that take into account our unique South African context of trying to find a way to stop being white churches and black churches and start being South African churches. We don't have these resources available. 
Um, we need to make these re- A lot of churches, individual churches, like the church we're in today, Grace Point, they record their, ser- their sermons every week. They put it online. But we're not gathering together. We're not combining our resources. We're not sharing those resources. We, we put them online, sure, that, that's at least something. But we're not, we're not thinking fourth industrial revolution. Some of us are hardly even thinking third industrial revolution. I mean, that might be a start, but we've got to get to the fourth one. So back to my question again. What aspects of the church need rethinking in the fourth industrial revolution? Two more minutes for your conversation, and then we'll take a break. Okay, we did start a bit late this morning, but we are not going to delay your your tea time too much longer. You've earned that. Keep this conversation going uh, as as we go out to the break. And I want to add one other thing into your conversation as as we go for a break. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, who I've mentioned a few times, he loves to say, Yes, we need change. Of course, we need change. But no one ever asks me what is not going to change. It's an interesting question, isn't it? When we talk about change, let's remember some things never change. His answer for a shop, customers will always want lots of choice at low prices with fast delivery. That will never change. If you can give me this thing at a cheaper price, I will be happier. If you can give me this thing now rather than tomorrow, I will be happier. So he says that will never change. So as you go to the break, let's think about what is not going to change in the church in the next 10 years as well as what must change. Okay, just so that we keep the conversation honest because not everything will change. Not everything will change. Okay. We are going to give you about 20 to 25 minutes uh, for a coffee break, so you can have a time to just, just chat, meet some friends, but keep these conversations going. This is a working coffee break. Okay, so coffee and, and refreshments are available outside. We'll see you back in about 20, 25 minutes. Shuffling Songs by Matt Redman on Amazon Music.
So that, that music that was playing during the break was courtesy of the Alexa. Just as people are, are, are trickling back in, one or two questions were asked during the break. One of the questions was, how much does an Alexa cost? The first answer is, that one's not for sale. Okay. <laughs> that one's my one. They're not available in South Africa, so you've got to work hard to get them. But it costs, uh, that one cost me 32 pounds. So let's call it 500 rand. Okay. So, I mean, it's not cheap but it's probably cheaper than you thought it was. Yeah. yeah. Just 500 bucks to get into the future. Seems worth it. Okay, I, I hope you had a good conversations during the break. I hope your mind is spinning a little bit. Keep, keep your lists of things that church must change because I'm not going to work with that list for you. Uh, and then, we, then we'll have a little bit more uh, interactivity now. So in this second half of this morning, uh, we're going to do a, a few things. We're going to now be a little bit more interactive about these issues as they relate to church. And then we're going to focus our attention on finances. Um, as one of the things we need to change in the church is the way we think about and deal with finances. And, and from a digital world perspective, uh, there are lots of changes coming in the way that we deal with money and engage with finances. So that is a, a particular focus that the team that put together this conference thought would be interesting. It's one example of the implications of the fourth industrial revolution, but it's a very important example uh, and a very important issue. So we're moving towards the finance conversation, but a few things. Just while you come back uh, from, from the break, uh, I just thought I'd want you to realize that it's not just about digitizing the church. It's not just about getting rid of all the humans, putting robots in, turning the church into something. It's not all about technology. Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 <laughs> okay, we don't have to take ourselves entirely seriously all of the time. Okay, that's just to get you back from the break. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly recap 
and share some principles. I've, I've called this section, How to Get There. Okay, so if we've now looked at these three key principles, there's a big question, what must we do? How do we get to the fourth industrial revolution? And what I'm going to ask you as I go through is to see if some of the things you've talked about now connect to my point. And then I'm going to ask you to, to speak to me about it. So, for example, one of, if, if one of the key principles of the fourth industrial revolution is, is about openness, mobility, the cloud, those platform thinking that I was talking about earlier, then surely one of the things we as church need to do is become more open, more open and collaborative and connecting and sharing of our resources with, with others. Now, it might be tempting to say as, as a township church, we don't have resources, we've got nothing to share. That's misunderstanding what we mean by connect and collaborate. I'll give you an example. My uh, girls go to a uh, private school uh, here in Johannesburg, um, and the private school has a foundation that raises money so that they can provide places for underprivileged girls, girls who could never afford to come to the school, um, but who would find real value in doing that. So they get scholarships and bursaries, which is a wonderful thing to do. Except a few years ago, the school changed how they talked about the foundation. For the first few years that the foundation was in place, the message was this. Wouldn't it be wonderful? And, and, and I'm going to use provocative language here but for you to understand. We sit there as the parents of privileged daughters. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could extend our privilege to a few underprivileged girls and they could join our daughters. That, that's not the language people were using, but that was the, the tone. Let's raise some money so we can give a gift to some poor people. About two years ago, though, the foundation made a huge shift in their language, and I love the shift. Now the language is this. If you want your daughters to be raised to be proper South Africans. You cannot raise them in this privilege. You must include people who are different. We must transform the school faster, which means people from different languages. So the school changed their policy. As of next year, every teacher at the school will have to speak a black language or they will be asked to not teach at the school anymore. Because, yeah, isn't that a good thing, right? That must be done. I think it must go further in the future. I think you will have to commit yourself as a parent. I'm talking now a white parent. You as a parent must learn a black language. Otherwise, why are you bothering? Why this school? We want people to think, that the reason I want to come to the school is I want an integrated experience. So the foundation now says, you must give us money to the foundation so that we can go and find young women who cannot afford to come here to join your daughters so that they can teach your daughters how to be a proper South African. Can you see the, the shift in attitude? So let's not only think that this is about financial resources from rich churches to poor churches. There's a richness in culture and heritage that can be shared. There's a richness in experience that can be shared. But what are we doing to share? Why in South Africa are we still thinking? Why do we use labels of that's a white church and that's a black church? How long, how much longer is it going to be before those labels are, are, are not valuable anymore? We've got to work hard. Uh, Bishop Tutu is still right that Sunday is still the most divided hour in our country, sadly. So I'm, now, now it sounds like I'm not talking about the fourth industrial revolution anymore, but I think I am. Because I think that our technology opens pathways to do these things. So when we begin to reimagine what our church might look like, 
in the fourth industrial revolution, we can bring all of our issues of social justice and integration and, and, and formation into this. But I think that one of the biggest barriers we have is that we are very good in the church at protecting our space. Are you in my synod or not? Are you in my society or not? Is this manyano money or is this the church money? Is this mine, my space? And I think we've got to kill that attitude, bury it, and find what comes from the resurrection when it's dead. Okay? So did anybody have any ideas about reimagining church that fits into this category of connecting and collaborating beyond our traditional boundaries? Anyone want to add to what I'm saying here? Yes. Please, uh, in fact, Carl, can it? Thank you. No, no, I'll bring it to you. Uh, we were talking about what does um, a digital online church look like? Yes. That's one. And connected to that and what you're saying now is how do we make that more accessible? And you yeah. said, why shouldn't churches be thinking intentionally about making a device available to everybody? The cheapest device. Yeah. So let me, I'm going to jump. Now, this is the only downside of not having my computer in front of me. You're going to have to see me like throwing slides around. But I'm going to jump now because I agree with you completely. Digitizing is another principle. So if you're taking notes, the first principle was connection and collaboration. The second, which you've led us to with that comment, is digitization. I've talked about examples like live streaming your, your church services and uh, WhatsApp counseling and things like that. But why shouldn't churches see it as a spiritual thing to provide free Wi-Fi and data for people uh, on a Sunday? Why shouldn't we put some budget aside to say this is a contribution that people can make? Somebody was talking to me during the break uh, about maybe providing daily devotions. This was you, Zimbo. Hey. Uh, you, you, you make the point. Can I have the microphone? Just say what you told me during the break. Um, I was indicating to Graham that I realized that um, mostly um, churches in townships have people that uh, struggle to find a space to, to worship because their houses are smaller and they live in crowded rooms, uh, in crowded ho homes. There's more of them, but the rooms are fewer. But if we digitalize and we send our sermons um, elect uh, through digital platforms like your WhatsApp and other forms, they can exercise that moment of worship even just before bedtime or lying in their bed. They can uh, do or, their meditation. Or in, in, in the taxi on the, the way to work or whatever. They, yes. they connect. Yes. Um, that way. And let's not, thank you, Zanelli, let's not forget that the access to this technology, yes, if you are richer, you can afford a better phone and more data. And if you are absolutely destitute, if you have no money at all and you are, haven't eaten for two days, then you're not going to have a phone and data. But in between those two is everybody else. 90% of our population has some form of mobile phone. And we can use e-wallet and M-Pesa and, and others. This is not restricted to only rich people. And maybe as a church, we need to begin to imagine that this is part of our contribution. Why can't we ask people in the richer societies in the suburbs, when you're finished with your phone and you're upgrading, don't throw the other one away or put it in a drawer. Let's donate it. Access to data, which then gives people access to spiritual resources, is maybe something the church should be uh, very focused on. Churches were amongst the first groups that, made books available that would print cheap. Church, did you know churches invented the paperback? Penguin, the, the, the paperback book was invented to make books cheaper, and some of the first books printed 
were Christian books, Christian formation books to put in people's hands. Um, so maybe this digitizing and digitizing for everyone, giving people access, um, data in your churches, maybe a laptop or two that's available during the week that people can come and use, that's got resources on it. Uh, maybe we can think. So again, the point I'm wanting to make is it's not just for rich churches in the suburbs. We must all be thinking of this access. her point in terms of streaming. I was reading an article. T.D. Jakes is the most streamed minister in the world, I'm told. And it's, it's just a thing of he invests in, he's got his podcast, yes. which is a huge following. Yeah. Um, he's got a radio, he's got an online radio station that podcast has now moved for that to being an online radio station. It has moved now. He's got an online. That's excluding the television. So he's got all these. He's securing all the bags in terms of the yes. digital space. Yes. And I think we have just as powerful ministers who, if we can invest, we can we can really run. We can really be on an Apple store. We have an account where Reverend Kuku makes money out of that. Yeah. Um, and we aim, and it's not just making money for the sake of it's crappy content. It is proper content. Yep. So we need to also then look at such uh, particular spaces as well. Love and monetize it. it. So that leads me to uh, the third principle, which I call social proof. Why hasn't that label come up? There we go. Social proof. Now, this is not about social media. This is not about saying your church has to have a Facebook page and an Instagram account, although it probably should, but that's not my point. My point is how do people make decisions these days? So let me give you an example. Somebody lives in this area. They go into Google and they say church. Okay? I'm looking for a church. A map comes up and says there are a whole lot of churches in your area they will be able to see that there is a church called Grace Point Church. They go into Google Maps, it shows them Grace Point Church, but down the left-hand side, it gives all the contact details, the address, the phone number, the website. And then, if they look further, it actually gives them, Grace Point, how many is that? 47 reviews. So there are some of the reviews of this church. This has got nothing to do with what Grace Point Church does. This is on Google. So Grace Point can't control these reviews. Did you know your church has probably got some reviews? Have you checked that? Now, if you can't really read that. The screen is too small. But that, that one uh, there at, at the bottom, um, let me see if I can do this. So that one over there, right? Somebody wrote, they live in the area. They don't come to the church. They just wrote, they said, thank you, Grace Point Church, for looking after the road. Because actually, Grace Point Church grades, and, and during sometimes in winter, they even water this dust road out here. And the community says, "That's thank you. That's just thinking of us as a community. Then somebody at Grace Point, that, that thing down there at the bottom there, um, is a, oh, I can't get it now. Uh, that thing at the bottom is a reply from Grace Point saying, it's our pleasure. We love to be part of this community. Please come and visit us at some stage and all the rest. Having this interaction. Um, at our little church at Melrose, uh, this is our Facebook page. You can't see here, but we have 450 people following our Facebook page. We only have 100 people coming on a Sunday but we have 450 people who consider themselves part of our online community. We live stream our sermons, um, and we have, as I say, between 80 and 100 people sitting in the congregation watching uh, Craig preach. Online, some of Craig's sermons get over 1,000 views. Are those people part of our congregation? I think they are. I think they are. Now, to pick up your point that you were making so beautifully, 
what happens if those people who are watching the sermon say, I love this church. I love the worship. Every Sunday I check in. Maybe if I'm not there on a Sunday, I watch it on a Monday or a Tuesday. Maybe there's a podcast channel. And then they say, is there a way for me to contribute maybe? Or we simply say, if you're enjoying these sermons online, please click here to just make a little contribution. And then maybe it's 10 rand, maybe it's 20 rand, maybe it's 50 rand. But then 100 people do it. Then 1,000 people do it. Then with T.D. Jakes, a million people do it. Now you've got no problems anymore. Um, so we've got to think about digitizing our systems and realizing what I said earlier, the real world is digital and the digital world is real. Not only for the people who can't be there on a Sunday but would be there, we record and make it available later, but other people who might think, yours is the church I want to connect to. They don't live anywhere in the area. Why couldn't they be part of your community? Make sense? Any other comments on that or anything that around digitizing your church that you were thinking of earlier? Does anybody want to add anything else? Let me bring you the mic just for the recording. I'm not, I'm not adding. I've just okay, please. Re you want to do I've something just else? Reviews, reviewed Jabavu Circuit. <laughs> <laughs> How many other people have, have reviewed? How many reviews has it got? Uh, Lots. You're scrolling. 17 for now. I think it's 17. Uh, five, there we it's go. Like five, uh, and it's getting, a four point, it's getting a 4.2 out of 5. That's yes. better than most of your Uber uh, <laughs> ratings. So that's good. So again, that was the point. Hey? They're handy. Yep. Coming to you. Good morning, everyone. We spoke about how to bring WhatsApp in Taipei. So you have your e-wallets and everything, but how do we bring digitizing and Taipei or in our churches, especially when you're coming from the less privileged churches? So as the ladies that I'm sitting with, we had that conversation, and one of the ideas that came up is, one of the churches they go to, they started it. For a few months, it went very well. But then after a while, it started depreciating. People didn't do their, you know, typing properly through the digital systems that we have. So what are the things that we can do to actually motivate people to do their typing or pleasures more often? So we can use WhatsApp. We can use um, text messages for those who don't have WhatsApp, because the reality is we don't all own iPhones mm. or Androids, right? So we look into so such things to say, okay, what do we have? Everyone almost has a cell phone, so maybe we have everyone's um, cell phone number, mm. and then we remind them to say, on such and such a date, don't forget to pledge. Mm. Don't forget, um, we could have debit orders. I mean, debit orders is there for everyone. Mm. And if, if, APSA can do it, then we can do it, you know? So we could have debit orders for pleasures as well on that platform in terms of digitizing um, for the less privileged people. Lovely examples. Remember what we're trying to do as a church is we are trying to guide people and then assist them to grow spiritually and to live the type of life that we believe Jesus has called them to live. Now, if tithing is part of that, if we believe that people should tithe, then if we help them to tithe, we're not finding ways to take their money. That could be your attitude, but that's not our attitude. Our attitude is helping people to do their spiritual disciplines and their spiritual duty. Then why is it inappropriate? to send somebody a text message on a Friday, the last Friday of the month when they get their salary and they get their wages to just remind them the church is here too. The church wants a little part of that. Um, and people don't have to bring their money on a Sunday. If they get their money on a Friday, we can allow them to give the God's portion of the tithe on a Friday. This is the mindset shift 
that the fourth industrial revolution invites us to begin considering. Does that make sense? I think these are lovely examples that we are giving. Just a few other principles, um, but we're heading in the right direction. This one was an interesting one. I, I, I wondered whether I, I should or shouldn't include this one. It's called gamification. Gamification, interesting word. It's using the principles and psychology of computer games to influence behavior. This is used a lot in the world of work. If you are on a discovery medical aid or a momentum, then you'll know you've got to earn points every week. 10,000 steps gives you certain points and so on. And it's those heading towards a target um, competition between you and other people. Uh, my car insurance is linked to an app that measures how well I drive. And then the first month I had it in, it tell, told me you are a very bad driver. Um, you are in the bottom 25% of all drivers in Johannesburg. And then they said, if you want to improve your driving, do less sharp braking, less uh, speeding. Um, and then I go, okay, I'll do that. And now I'm in the top 25% of drivers in Johannesburg. And they've helped me to become a better driver because of gamification, putting me in a, in a leaderboard. Now, <laughs> can we use this in church? Now, I'm not suggesting we have a leaderboard for the most tithes, okay? That's not <laughs> spiritual at all, okay? Um, that's not how it works. But maybe we can set targets. Some churches do this. We have a target. We want to raise a certain amount of money. And there's a poster on the wall at the front of the church that says, here's the target. And now we are here. And now we're here. And people get excited that we are working towards something. All of those are gamification principles, using the principles of competition and challenges and rewards and so on uh, in our churches. Did anybody have any conversation that maybe led in that direction? Okay, that's something to think about. Now, two more things, and, and then we, I'm going to hand over to our, our next speakers in a few minutes. The second last thing to say is that we have to get more comfortable with experimentation. We are not going to move into the fourth industrial revolution by having committee meetings and thinking about the future and then only doing something when we are 100% certain it will work. Truly, this conference is even an example of this. We, we've got the lay leaders in the synod taking a lead here, saying we will, we will listen to the presiding bishop and we will respond. And, and who knows? How many people will arrive? We have no idea. We're going to just see what happens. We're going to try it. First time we've ever done it. Let's see what happens. We're going to live stream this as well. We're going to use all sorts of technology here. Maybe it works, maybe it fails, but we're going to give it a go. We're not scared. That's the attitude of experimentation. Um, by the way, this is a very biblical thing. Jesus took his disciples and he said, go out two by two, go out into the villages, preach the gospel, heal the sick, what do you think his disciples said when he said that? What? Are, me? Us? Are you mad? you the teacher. you the rabbi. You do it. Jesus said, no, go, go, go. It's fine. You'll be fine. Do you think that they succeeded every time? Do you think the first time Peter went to somebody, be healed. I can see Peter doing a big voice, be healed. You know? And nothing happened. And then he comes back, uh, Lord, that didn't work. And Jesus said, try again. Try again. This is spiritual formation. It doesn't work first time. Try again. Let's develop it. That, the business word for that is experiment. But we know it as development and mentoring and, and growth. Now, of course, you don't want to experiment with things that can burn the place down. Okay? So you don't want huge experiments. We're going to give you an example. Our next speaker is going to give you an example that we've come up with as the committee here of, of a financial experiment. But it's not an experiment with the pastor's retirement fund. Yeah, you don't want to experiment with that, okay? Some things you leave, okay? They're fine. They're not broken. Don't break them. I, I'm going to skip that one. But... Sometimes we have to try something, even if we, if we fall over. And then we try it again. Even if we fall again, then we try it again and again. Just don't be this last guy. 
Okay. So you don't be the guy who thinks, ah, oh, now we have to fail. Okay. It's not that we're trying to fail. Let me go back to, to Bill Gates again. It's fine to celebrate success, but it's way more important for us to try things because we know that what we are currently doing is, is actually not going to survive. I started with that. And sorry, I'm just trying to move to a different slide here. I'll get there in a second. I started with that this morning. It's a bold statement, but I don't think there's much argument that if we just keep doing what we've always done, we are going to die as a church. I think we know this. I don't think we need a lot of debate and discussion. So the only question is, well, what change do we actually need? What innovations do we really need? And more importantly, what must we unlearn as a church? And this is the point I want, to, I want to leave you with before we flip to, sp to focusing specifically on finances. Unlearning is like painting a new wall. If you don't strip that old paint off, if you just paint the new paint over the old paint, what will happen? It will crack again very soon. The new paint will be wasted. We do this all the time with church. We try a new thing, a new thing, but we don't undo the old thing first. We have to unlearn what we are doing. Now, I wanted to demonstrate this, and I'm, I'm going to need a volunteer or two here to help me. A little while ago, I saw this example online. Can you see that bike there has had the, the steering changed? I cut the bike and I put a, a cog in here. That means if I turn the steering to the right, the front wheel turns to the left. If I turn the steering to the left, the front wheel turns to the right. You see, we know how to, those of us who know how to ride bikes, we can ride them. It took us a while to learn as kids to ride the bike. Now what I wanted to know is how long would it take to unlearn riding a bike? Now I promise you, I promise you that there is nobody in this room that can ride this bike. Nobody. In fact, I'm going to stand across the other side there about five meters away, not far. You're going to only have to go and turn once like this. You have to turn the wheel once over without putting your feet down. And if you can do that, I will give you 500 rand. <laughs> come, 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 Anneli. Come, come. No, 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 no. That was good volunteering. Come, come, come. Come, you can't get away now. You can't get away. Not for the 500 grand. <laughs> I thought my side had been ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is tax-free gift. <coughs> <laughs> you're not even. <laughs> you're not even peddling. Come and try. Somebody try. Somebody. Here we go. We've got some good. We've got some people coming here. You can't ride this bike. <laughs> you couldn't even do two meters, let alone five meters. I've got two of them here. You can try afterwards uh, a little bit, those who want to. The reason for that is because most of what you do to ride a bike is unconscious. If, if I tell you your bike's going to fall over to the left... Which way do you turn the steering to correct that? No, you don't even know. I promise you, you don't even know. You'll say to the right, you'll say to the left, but your body does it instinct. You don't think about it, you just do it. Your problem is, because you do it by instinct, now when, you're, when it's going in the opposite direction, the instinct pushes it in the wrong direction, then you overcorrect 
to go the other way, and then you're falling off before you've even done one turn. This is where we are in the church now. We are in a change in society. We are in the world. We are changing economic eras from the, from the industrial world to the digital world. In the economy, we are changing from the third to the fourth industrial revolution. In society, we are changing from apartheid to New South Africa. In our psychology as people, we are changing to the millennial generation, to the born free generation. In our politics, we are changing from the ANC, who we thought would solve all our problems when we gave them power, to, whoa, who's got any solutions? Every part of our world is changing. Do you imagine that the church will not change? Do you imagine that the church as we've always had it is the solution for the future? If it maybe even wasn't the solution for the past. So now we have to unlearn what we have been doing. Not throw out everything. This is still a bicycle. Most of this bicycle still works the way it should work. Except for the, the main thing. And so that's our conversation today, is how do we unlearn and then relearn uh, and, and grow again? Uh, I'm just going to skip these two videos here. This is, a, this is a guy who's showing us how to do it, but I've shown it to you here. So here's my final quote. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write. And this is a wonderful thing for the poor people of our country to hear. Because the people who will lead us into the future are not going to be the rich people. The rich people want to protect their, themselves. We, we see this in the, in the way that they're building their systems in the world. It's poor people who have the most potential to step into a new space because they've got the least to lose. And so it is the unexpected people who must lead us now. It is the people who have wisdom resources who must lead us. And we have to learn how to listen um, and engage and connect. That, for me, is what the fourth industrial revolution means. So, to flow now, to a financial conversation very, very quickly. What does the fourth industrial revolution mean then for our finances? Let's, uh, we've got two more speakers who will come now and guide us in this conversation. But for me, we must acknowledge that our churches are in trouble. We are not getting the money in that, that we used to get in. We're not getting in the money in that we need. We are struggling for resources. Part of that is because our economy is struggling, but part of that is because we as a church are out of date, and people are saying, I don't want to waste my money. So we as ministers and church leaders and pastors and bishops, we need to take the future seriously. That's what we've been trying to do this morning. But we also need to take finances seriously, and we need to think differently about finances. Did you know that the Bible mentions heaven about 15 times. It mentions money 670 times. There is, in fact, no other subject in the Bible that is mentioned more than money and the economy. Now, that needs to be reflected in what we speak about, what we preach about, and if I can be very, very direct to those of you who are pastors and ministers, you need to take more responsibility for the money conversations. Some of your church leaders have told you, no, no, pastor, this is not your conversation. We look after the money, you look after the, the spiritual stuff. That cannot be a conversation going forward. Our pastors, our, our, our church leaders must work together to develop an understanding of finances. So what, is this, what does this mean for us? And, and in fact, I'm going to repeat this slide to say, I'm not just talking about churches with lots of money. 
This is every church in, in, in every part of it. What does it mean? I think it means simply pastors, ministers, church leaders, society stewards must all have some financial literacy. There cannot be any excuse. I don't understand money. How can you live in the world and not understand money? You know, get yourself educated so that you can look at the accounts, so that you can know whether something's happening, so that you can speak intelligently about finances. This is a conversation um, that, that you need to be having. Secondly, I think that pastors and ministers must take a lead in the financial conversations. We'll see what this means with the next two speakers uh, as they come along. But for me, this needs to be something that there's no embarrassment in talking about because this is a critical part of our ministry. This is a critical part of what makes our churches successful or not successful. Most churches collapse for two reasons only. One, the pastor messes up personally. There's a, there's a, there's a moral failure in the leader or there's a financial failure. Those are the, those are the two main reasons churches fail. Um, and, and so it is an absolutely essential leadership element that, that as, a, as, a, as a pastor uh, in a church that you are seen to be taking a lead and that you are not embarrassed about having these conversations, which means, of course, there is a change in our attitude that is required uh, around money. And that's what our next two speakers are going to speak about. So if the fourth industrial revolution leads us to understand that there is an invitation for a, for a lot of change, that there are a lot of principles around collaboration and diversity and personalization and curiosity and experimentation, all the things I've spoken about, then if we apply that into the financial space, there's a lot of reimagination to, to do there as well. Now, before I finish, and I'm, I'm just a few minutes over my, my time slot, but just in case there are uh, one or two questions, let me give just an opportunity. Any burning questions uh, for you? Let me bring you the microphone. And then Tobeka can get ready because she's taking over from the center. Oh, thank you. Um, mine is not really a question, but it is a comment to sure. say, after all said and done, these things, they rise or fall on the sort of leadership. 100%. It is all about leadership. We can attend a conference like this, treasurers and all, and, you know, and get out of here motivated to make a difference. But if at the kind of leaders that we have are not inclined and do not see the change that is already happening, it will not happen. Exactly. Yeah. Further, I want to say the Methodist Church is one church that is deeply rooted in traditions and culture. Yeah. And therefore, this kind of thing, I can promise you, can't take catch fire in all six countries of our connection all at the same time. Yes. yes. For those that are in leadership, I don't know who's here, but they can catch it and run with it. Yeah. I think one of the one of the fine strategies that we can have is to have a sample. Because you see for, for change to happen, people need to see it being implemented by somebody that they trust in and they see mm. them fail and make it a success. Mm. So it might help the current leadership of our church to then say, let's identify, to make an example, 12 ministers in the connection who are committed to this program of change. And we say, we are going to station you in places that resemble the kind of communities that we have with a clear mandate of pushing the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. So you have your 12 guinea pigs mm. who will be planted in rural setting, city setting, township setting, um, whatever kind of setting. That will ultimately then give us a chance to have a review mm. of how do different people in different communities 
react to this kind of change where the ministers have been given the leadership mandate and support to say, be bold, be courageous, implement this. And as we learn lessons, then it catches fire strategically. People will begin to then say, if these 12 could do it in, in a shack place, an informal settlement, exactly. a rural place and all that and all that, then it is most probably going to happen. And therefore, we, 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 we help people to see that it can happen like that. Thank you. I, I love that as a summary of, of, of what I was saying. Um, and that's why we put this conference together. So this conference is, is not part of a steering committee. Our, our goal as a team who, who put the content together was not to say that we come to the end of the day and we, we come up with a resolution and we do something. We, we want to change the way we think about it. It's going to be experiments. It's going to be the sorts of things that you're thinking about. So have these things in your mind as, as you listen now uh, to uh, some ideas of, of where we can go next. Um, and keep these ideas in your mind so that we can work out together what the next steps are going to be. You're exactly right. It's not going to be a big project that comes from the top and comes down. It's going to emerge. That's why it's coming from the lay leadership from the bottom. But let's remind ourselves, just last night, we uh, truly got a note from the presiding bishop saying, thank you for the conference. You know, I'm, I'm backing you. This is a good thing that you're doing. That's why we had Bishop Rivas here uh, this morning, and we're in his home church to say, we want this to happen, but now we're putting it in your hands. Um, and we want to see what will happen in, in different places. Right. I have taken too much time already, so I'm going to uh, cut it there. I'm going to hand back to you, good sir. You wanted to come back again on to stage? Yes. yes. To hand over to the next person. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, yes, I Graham. think let's give him a round of applause for this beautiful, beautiful presentation. And I hope that we've been challenged to begin to rethink and reimagine um, and, and see what we should be doing differently going forward as the as the Methodist Church. You are indeed a gift into into the church. And thank you so much for your time as well and the quality of the presentation. Um, my friends, just just to say we have these presentations be sent to you. You don't necessarily have to take notes and, and take pictures. I see a lot of people taking pictures of the presentations. We will um, um, give them to you at the end of the of, of the sessions, and um, you would have realized as well that the 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 presentation are done into in an interactive manner. So whenever that you feel you want to contribute something, ask a question, just engage the speakers. They're willing to take uh, that kind of a conversation. Our next speaker would be speaking onto the digital era of the financial options. Um, I, I wrote something. I didn't lose this one. Um, so I'm just going to be reading in introducing her. Utobeka Sishuba Bonoi. She comes from the Mondio Methodist Church. I saw people here um, showing off of their churches and everything else. We have a speaker from the Mondio Methodist Church. She is an economist. Uh, with three degrees, including master's in taxation and governance expert. She currently works at the digital, op as, uh, um, at the digital operator as group company secretary, experienced in retail and spent time in financial services at executive level. Now, currently, she serves as a director in private wealth, um, investment, and asset, asset ma management. Um, ladies and gentlemen, assist me to bring Utobeka Sishuba Bonoy on to the. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, 
it's better to give a round of applause when a woman stands so that if you're not impressed, you don't have to, I don't have to worry about the round of applause when I sit down. So if you may give me another round of applause. <laughs> Sounds better. Uh, Mem says this is the Women's Month, and I think it's not only because I'm a speaker, but because also I represent women in this room. Um, now, my topic, I think I would really love it to be more interactive than it is. Um, I'd like us to, 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 to listen to, to this video that impressed me in terms of digital era. And I'm very aware that, you know, there are things that you cannot quantum leap. But this one, it takes it to the next level, which I think, as the Methodist, we're going to get there. It might not be in my time, like Moses did not get to Kanana, but it will be the time of our children that are in our church today. I see youth today, and I'm challenging you to challenge your societies, to say, yes, we are on a journey, but with some of the things we need to quantum leap them to get there. And the, the, the last speaker that spoke about what next, you will hear the vision of what we believe could be the next steps. And this contribution from this group is going to be, be vital. And therefore, remember that and keep that in mind. Yeah. God. I'm God. I'm Kafi Sorabada. This is the Standard Bank Forex Speed Track Challenge. Standard Bankers asked the Proteas to help them demonstrate the incredible speed of the Shift Forex trading app. Our customers are shopping on their phones, they're booking their travel on their phones. It made absolute sense to bring foreign exchange to their phones. Kahiso will step onto the pressure sensor at the crease. This will trigger the trade of the Standard Bank Shift app. May the fastest win. Shift app lets you trade at speeds equal to that of South Africa's fastest bowlers. Because Standard Bank knows when it comes to Forex, time isn't money, speed is. Download Shift from the App Store and start trading right now. Let there be light. In a split second, Rabada was able to throw the ball and hit the wicket in split seconds. The question is, as you're sitting here as the leaders of the societies, what speed are you going to move in making the change that we're talking about? What is that speed that you, as the leaders of the church, as the ministers of our church, you are going to move. That is the challenge. We can never be sitting in here and be listening to speakers that are from overseas, TD Jakes. We've got to believe and say, in the Methodist church, we must have examples in the Methodist church. Examples in the Methodist church. Because that's where we believe we are going. And therefore, we cannot go in that speed without you as leaders and the ministers of our church doing so. There is light. There is innovation. What does that mean for us? You know, when, when you talk about innovation, with Pam has spoken to it to death. Mine is about financial innovation. And when I talk about financial innovation, it's not things that are not done. We've heard things that are being done. The question is, what are we going to do? What is very important 
always say this. You must always diagnose your problem. So you must go through a state of doing a diagnostic analysis because that will give you the data that you need in order to do things that you want to experiment with. That's very important. And it doesn't matter how small it is. Always we think that innovation is a big thing. We've seen the fourth, the first and up to the fourth revolution in terms of technology. It was never a quantum leap, but it was a step change. And therefore, as you innovate from a financial perspective, remember, you've got to do diagnostic. When you do that, remember, you've got to know who you have in your society. You've got to know that. This is what impacts us, one, as congregants, and two, as employees, employers, informal settlement, economic downturn. Tito came up with a growth plan, and I loved one of the things he talked about is spectrum. Because we can never move in South Africa into getting into high levels of digital at a grassroots level where there is lack of inclusiveness. Because people from the rural areas can't afford data. But data is, is becoming much more expensive, but because we don't have spectrum. And Tito spoke about spectrum, which means that everybody, everywhere will have access to data. But you've got to know that as leaders, because once that happens, what are you going to do? Remember, you've captured those who have data. They will be able to log onto their systems. They've got um, apps that are able to provide them with what? With access to banking information. But once you've got better spectrum, you've got to think differently. How are we then going to become more inclusive? We spoke about areas in our societies where they're unable to get information. Not only in the rural areas, even areas within Gauteng where we are operating, where they don't have access to data. Economic downturn. Low growth. There's so many companies with the digital um, revolution that are now retrenching. High levels of retrenchment. So that means as leaders and, and ministers, you are sitting in your pews with high levels of unemployment. Somebody today is working and tomorrow there is a retrenchment. How are we dealing with that? That's the problem I've diagnosed, and I'm going to tell you how I believe we can deal with that. Because we are faced with unemployment. There's no longer security of employment. We are broke. We are unable to, die, to tithe every month. You are unable to come to church and bring collection, let alone be on your app and data and do an e-wallet or have a debit order. But we've got to solve that as leaders of the church. Because for us to be sustainable, we wait for a month for a collection every month. We wait for a tithing every month. We wait for pledge every month. But we're faced with bankruptcy. We're faced with our congregants who are highly indebted. We've got to solve that problem. This fourth industrial revolution is bringing a different change in business. Because businesses who are like videos, you know when you go to the video shop and you, and you hire a video, they kind of like not existing anymore because of 
the financial revolution. We, can, we have heard so many retail companies struggling because why? They did not reinvent themselves. Because of what? Now we've got take a lot. I don't have to go to the shop to do that. So these are the challenges we're sitting with. We're running on empty. How then are you going to fill the tank? Can anybody here tell me in their church with all these challenges, and I can promise you, when you looked at the numbers, five years ago, you were able to say, ah, this church is sustainable. Five years down the line, we all are scrabbling. We're trying to figure out who in the church has, can, can give us this, who in the church can actually put up the electricity, who in the church can provide security, who in the church can even do a simple thing, pay the detergents to clean the church. Can, can anybody tell me in their own societies or in their own um, circuits, do you have the money? Do we have money to pay the stipend? Who has figured it out then what to do? Who, who in your societies has figured this out? That, okay, now we are struggling. Actually, I've got a plan. And this is the plan. You can, you can put up your hand, and then we will we'll give you the mic, and then you share your experience. You might be on empty, and you might think that you are halfway through, but you're still running on empty because it's not sustainable. You are waiting for the members to come every month and to give a pledge. Because you think you are full, you are doing nothing about it. Because you have members who are working, and every month they give you pledge. They tithe. And you think, ah, you know I'm full. You know in Melrose, I have gram. You know, I'm full. I promise you, you are on empty. There was a hand. Um, my sister there, she raised her hand. If you don't mind to pass on the mic. Just your name, my sister, and then uh, your comment or um, a question. Yes. My name is Nomfundo. I'm a society steward at the Robert Cham Methodist community. We are actually... <laughs> We're in that, what we're talking about right now, at our specific community, and we're looking at different ways of how to generate income for the church that doesn't heavily rely on tithes and um, collection. We looked at one of the biggest businesses in our communities. We have a property that we own opposite the church that actually used to house a, they used to, we let it out to a crutch, but over time it, it wasn't, the relationship then fell through. And we thought to ourselves, but why don't we have a courage? We have so many women in our community that don't work. We just need to get up to speed of how do you open up a courage, what's required, how do you, how do, you do this? And that's what we're actually undergoing at the, at the moment. And we're looking at bringing in just from that project alone about 52,000 per month. You've got to clap for that. Brilliant. Because the reliance yeah. is no longer on the membership. Yeah. Yeah. It's no longer on membership. It's about sustainability, not only for the current, but long term. And that's what sustainability is about. There's another hand here, if, if we may. I'm not like Graham, I'm in high heels, so oh. I'm never going to run like <laughs> a Rabada. Okay, Mlungi Simbela from Jabavu Seket. Um, my society, it's, it's really praying to get by. Um, it's, <laughs> did we just survive? Did we just survive? Did we just survive? Um, and solutions, I'm glad that my second steward is here. One of the projects we engaged on, um, we spoke to 
um, a, de a department from government. They are currently now going to assist us in starting agriculture, farming, um, because in Jawavu, we have huge hectares of land um, that we do not use. Um, and they, all they wanted was a letter to say, this is your land, can you agree? We will bring you the resources, we will teach you how to farm, and you will farm. Um, and we are already also in the process in speaking with local businesses, your shop rights and whatnot, once that project is up and running, to then supply them with that particular uh, food. Another trend that w we've discovered, there's something called aqua farming. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the future. Um, old abandoned buildings, we have a lot of them. There's one is SM Fulo, We've inquired, we want to start an aqua farm in that particular vicinity because one, we are moving from planting from the outside because of weather patterns that change, because of global warming that changes. So now we're moving into aqua farming, which means in a building that is as big as this space, we can run a fully fledged farm, which can really then run an economy that can benefit close to about 10 million rand, if my estimates are correct. So those are things that are still in, in, in the pipelines to help assist this beast called unemployment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just take one more. Remember, you are no longer have to rely on membership. This is why we urge you cannot rely on membership. And we've heard already that we are going to be all, some of the societies are on podcast. So which means even if you have a, a, thou, a, a, a thousand a membership a in, 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 in the women's manyano, you find that only 20 can be able to contribute meaningfully. And therefore, what are we then doing in even our own organizations? Because the church is requesting tithing and pledging from the same mothers and the same fathers and the same youth that we are asking them to pay for other responsibilities in the church. I belong to Maniano, I'm in the youth, you know, um, and, and, and I'm in the church, and the church says we must have this, I must take out of my pocket. The church says we must do this, I take out of my pocket. The, for how long? Will I be thinking that I am full, whereas I am, am empty? One question, then I move to my next slide. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Umabu Chowasto, Sipumanda Oyen and Fogam Pele Chabavu. At Dubai Methodist Church. Now, Umfundis Mukumutsula Pemova Mfogadu Tulin touched a very relevant point. Very relevant. It is time, part of the mindset shift. Ogmelesians as a church mm. is to listen to and act on the teachings of our church, which talks about the each member ministry, where that recognizes that everyone who's created by God has got a gift that he or she has been given. And that gift must be allowed must be given an opportunity to flourish or to be implemented. So, if, if that can happen, then we are fine. If we could understand that we are partners in mission, no challenge, no challenge that will unfortunately or unfortunately 
be bigger than all of us. But the, the mistake that you are trapped in is the I syndrome as opposed to the we. So if we can just change that mindset of the moving from the I to the we, all these brilliant ideas would be implemented and the church would move away from the current state. Thank you. And, and, and so so what, what I'm saying, I'm adding by saying, if all these beautiful ideas find a progressive leadership, then we are gone. Because you can't be the be all and the end all. You can't know them all. So delegate without abdicating. Thank you. And, 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 and therefore, it is very important for you to be able to move and shift from E towards F. It's about ethical and effective leadership. That's just another space that I'm in in terms of good governance. But I'm never going to touch on that because my task is to talk about these financial vehicles and financial options that we could talk to. And what is so also important is that even if you choose society leaders or circuit leaders that don't have financial acumen, have a finance committee that provides you with that backup. Because sometimes you might find in the church that you have a lot, it's, it's been touched on, you have a lot of capacity in the pews as leaders, but because it's about I must stand, I must be seen to be giving the financial report when you can have a finance team that supports you. That's what the church is all about. And, 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 and I love the pillars of the church because I always say spirituality is an overarching. Because we, I can talk about economic empowerment, but if I'm not spiritually connected, I'm never going to get there. Very important. But I do want to talk about, um, very briefly, Before I get to my unit trust, I want to get to um, I'm on slide six. Just after the Are you here? Yes. Thank you. So, it is very important that society level Second level, you have financial conversations. And I did talk about accountability, that you've got to have your finance. Current state, we've emphasized that. For you to be able to move, what is your current state? We've, sh we've shared already the current state of some of the societies and what others are doing because we want to move. I promise you, sustainability is never about short-termism. It's long-term. Financial options, they are never going to give you value today. If somebody comes to you and say, invest today and tomorrow you're going to get 20%, run for your life. Run for your life. The best things, we wait patiently. You know, for the Lord, we wait patiently so that the Holy Spirit moves us. Why is it going to be different then when you're putting your money? All of a sudden, you're no longer waiting patiently for the Lord. You're running. You will run afar, I promise you, if you run together. You run faster and fall if you run alone. 
treasurers of the societies, treasurers of the circuits, treasurers of the synod, and treasurers in the connection long term. Long term. You're never going to know that long term view unless you surround yourself with the people with the right knowledge. Our ministers can, and I heard Ukram saying, let's not touch the pension fund. I'm saying, what is the value of the pension fund? We have ministers who've been in the church for 40 years. When they leave, they can't afford a house. Why can't we then change when we bring in innovation? So that when our ministers leave the church, they can easily say, I am moving to a, a, a house that I was provided by the church that I've served for 40 years. Instead, our ministers, they move into a back home. I don't know where to go. Can I just have your back room? We've got to shift. I'm challenging the connection. Long term. What are we doing? Supernumerary are suffering. We have never thought of long term. It is about time that we say, whoever is going to retire tomorrow is going to be different going forward. We've got to begin to say that at a connectional level. You know, the societies where the ministers are retiring, they run around because they're trying to get 500,000 so that the minister can go and buy a home. Now I ask for the women's manano, you must bring 150,000. I go to the guilders, you must bring 50,000. I go to the, the men's league, bring 50,000. From where at the last minute? From where at the last minute? Because we've never thought of finances in the long term, but spiritually we were fed. We've got to change that. And I've never had enough a society that says, no, 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 no. You know, uh, in four ways, we have two million. We hear that there's a minister somewhere in the Limpombo region is suffering and the minister is living. Here is 500,000 from the church. That two million has gone up into the church to make sure when the ministers retire, that other church that can afford is able to provide the other church that is still on empty. The thing of the Methodists, we are communal. We are not like T.T. Jakes who stand on his own and make millions for himself. No, in the Methodist church, the million that you have, you must know that you must feed the other ministers in societies where they can't afford. But currently, we don't do that. Because what? I look, hey, which church I must go to? Uh -uh, I don't want that one in Kukumbu. Where is that Kukumbu? In Clegstop. Uh -uh, I don't want to go there. Uh -uh, yeah, yes, definitely. I will take that one. Yes, that one in this place feels good. I can see they can, they've been paying stipend. They've been paying. We must move away from that. We must move away from that. Long term, what does that mean then? And I said, I'm challenging. I'm going to give you options, but I promise you, they're not everything. There's so much out there. But the principles, if we get them right, if we get those principles right, I promise you, everything will be long term. We all want to get to the new state. We've got to get to the new state. And that new state is going to provide us all those four things. Liquidity. You know, you know that I have moved from empty a long time ago. Even if I'm sitting in the middle, I'm okay because I can still drive. And as I'm sitting in the middle, it's sustainable in the middle. I don't have to get to full because the middle has got security. 
We've heard what other societies are doing. There's growth. And the growth that I'm talking about, and I'm not leaving the growth of the spiritual growth of a person, which is key and critical, but it's the financial growth. It's important. Otherwise, my whistle, I promise you, I need a young so. Sustainability. You can never have sustainability when you don't have ethical leadership and ethical accountability. And you know, I always say, leadership is not about you leading. Sometimes you wait to be led. Allow that in the space when you are a leader in the church, you know that you don't have it. But somebody in the midst of God's pews has got it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to begin. Forget about ethnicity. Forget about black and white. When you belong in the Methodist, there is no ethnicity. There is nothing black and white in the Methodist church. And fortunately, those who left the Methodist, good luck. We progressive in the Methodist church. So, we, we, we believe in this unity. We believe in this communal. So, let, uh, let others to lead you. Because remember, they're not being led by themselves. They're being led by the Holy Spirit which is hovering all the time amongst us. So why do you think then, as a leader, you must do everything yourself? I promise you, you will tire. And you'll make your church stay on empty. Allow, allow, allow to be led. Allow to be led. I am saying, Seth Mokitin, where our ministers are being trained, bring finance for non-financial managers. When you talk about spirituality and theology, bring, bring God's money in it. What's wrong with that? It's God's money. When your people feel that they are spiritually fed, they must be able to run the race and say to the church, yeah, I'm giving thanks to God. So we, we, we must not allow only the, 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 the religion and the theology as if religion and theology is not about God's money. It's about God's money, sustainability. I'm going to run through all of this. I can give you a list. I can talk about property. We've heard about property, which is real estate. We've heard about land and agriculture. We've heard about those. And let me tell you, when, I, when you look at unit trust, the companies that are making money, my brother, because all they do, they only la own land. And they use that land to create value in that unit trust portfolio. There are entities, my sister, that are actually have got properties that are listed in a stock exchange. Imagine one day, dream, sister, dream. Imagine that property. Yeah, 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 sir, Robert, um, there's more property you buy after that rental. More property. And one day we hear, Reverend Sham has got a listed property on the JC Stock Exchange. Why can't we dream big? We've got land. Tomorrow you wake up and you come to the church and you say, we've, we've planted grapes. We've planted uh, all the fruits and the vegetables, and actually we are selling to Woolworths, to Pick and Pay, to Spa. To Why can't we do that as a church? When I grew up, the churches used to be places of education. And that is an example. You need trust. Societies create a unit trust account. Now, I don't, I, 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 I am a director in one of the financial services, but I'm not even going to give you which one that you must, you, 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 you must do your unit trust because I'm not here to give you financial advice. Mm -hmm. 
What do you do then with that when you do the Google? It will give you a company that is thinking long term. Don't go to unit trust that promise you 30%. I can promise you in, in, in a period of, of two years. Because we all are living in an economy that is on the downturn. So we know what is the economic environment is looking. And therefore, when you look at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, you can see how the shares are doing. But you've got to have long time in mind. Don't run when I say cryptocurrency and I'm seeing the doors are opened. It is going to be the future of exchanging money. I can tell you that. Whether you want to be the first one there or the last one, even in your individual capacity, imagine if you have a unit trust today. Actually, let me give you my example. When I started working, I could only afford 200 rand a month unit trust. I did not deter or move even when things were not. I decided not to buy high heels. Then I know that I've got that 200 rand. Got to think like that, mothers. 20 years ago, and that unit trust, you can imagine, if the church has done the same thing, that the church creates a unit trust account, and every month, every month, just a thousand rand, every month, how much money you will leave in the church when somebody else takes over. And remember, it's not about you now. Forget about that mentality. I promise you, whatever I'm saying to you today, do you think that you want to have a unit trust that before you leave as, an, as, as, as a church steward in three years, wherever you get reappointed? No, 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 it must be a three-year thing so that the church can see, plant the seed. Because you want the next generation to be able to say, we are moving from the shoulders of those who were before us. We've done that in the upper eight years. We're moving on the shoulders of those. I mean, who say, who would known one day somebody like me, black female, standing in the church, right in the middle of everything that is white? Who thought about that? Because I am standing on the shoulders. And I'm saying, it's not a mistake. Plant now. Plant now. You will reap the benefits. Share the link. Oh, people always think that these things are things that they can't do. You can do it for yourself. And you know when you buy shares, you are still on empty. You buy shares. They pay dividends. When they ask you for tithing, you just take from your dividend account and you say, praise the Lord. Because those companies, they pay dividends. Mama, you don't need 50,000 for things like that. But you've got to have long term. And I'm saying you can start today in your individual capacity, but you've got to take this and tell others because you've got to multiply. Live at the grassroots so that the youth that we see today, when they take over, Baba, one day when you are a society steward, you want to say, wow, there is this benefit that was left that I can only grow from it. This is an experiment. I was spoken already about the pension fund, and I think, and I said to, to Craig, when you come back from the district, uh, the synod executive committee, whatever, I said to him, just give me the, the, the numbers. Just give me what you're investing in. I promise you, yes, I'm not the best out there, but I think I can add my cent in that conversation. That talks about the minister's pension. An experiment. Ministers fellow fund. Ministers, they get this when they complete their 10 years. Doesn't come from the societies. 
all the societies feel is when a minister says, ah, this is my fellow year, and I'm taking three months. But imagine, if a minister knows that in 10 years they will be having, they'll be going on fellow. Year one, the church, the money that they're putting aside to give to the minister, they put that in year one. Imagine what will that be in 10 years' time. What will that be in 10 years' time? Because the, the ministers only get that on the 10th year, same amount. But if the church, long term, they have the data, they've done the diagnosis, they know who their ministers, which year they've joined, which year they're coming on 10 years, and all and all and all, and start doing that. Number of financial options. The conversation must be led, and I think this district. To experiment, you should start. This district, to experiment, you should start. We've got ethnicity issue. We've got black and white still in the church, others in the seven, eight, eight, eight nine, the eight others, 11. So much to do. And I promise it's never going to be a quantum leap, but we must pin through everything because with God, who strengthens us, we can do everything. Let's not forget that. And every time we believe that there's a barrier in what we want to do, the Bible says, put it to the Lord. And therefore, change. Without change, there's no hope. Hallelujah. May I ask for comments? May I ask for questions? I work for this digital company, I'm gonna say it, I'm, I'm noting a hand. I always say, I've got you everywhere you go. But I can't go unless I have champions in societies and circuits. And we can do it. Thank you, my sister. Good morning, or good afternoon. Afternoon, Mama. I'm Ma Edna from Deep Blue Zone 2. My comment is, I wish the discussions of today were not given this small today. We would have had presentations today and sleep over them, and tomorrow after actually looking at yourself doing a real retro inspection, you come up with tangible, not solutions as uh, the, the first speaker said, but with tangible uh, input. You know that change, Change is difficult. In change, you have got three components. You are coming with change as a mover, and you have got an affirmer, and you have got this blocker here. And the blocker is the one who is bringing the whole problem. But you also have the one who is abstaining, which is the most dangerous. Because the affirmer will affirm, the blocker will simply say, I'm not going to take it. But the one that is sitting and observing is going to influence the decision at the end 
Isaac for positive or negativity. The things that have been presented to us as leaders sitting here, you go back and give the report. And the first thing that you are going to get when you get there, they say, oh, labo mama ba kungile, labo ba zulu, the old people that don't want to leave the chairs. He does not look at what are you bringing that you were given by your daughter here to impart with them so that they must change the situation within the church for the better. And the other thing which is worrying is, you are not going to tell us to change now. So my, my comment is we need to level the playing field education in order for us to move forward in unison. I don't know how we are going to do it. Thank you. I'll take two comments, three comments, um, because I promise you I, I, I have a response, very clear response, Mama. Thank you for that. Hi there. I'm Bridget. Um, I think one of the key things, though, is around we have to make sure that any education that's done financially is done by people who are highly qualified to actually give advice, you know, and, and particularly around making sure that how we deal with money matters from a church, the church's money, versus individuals with their money. If, as a church, I'd gone and bought a Bitcoin in December 2017, I would have paid 13,000 US dollars for that. A year later, it would have been worth 3,000 US dollars. So we as a church also have to be very careful that we are very responsible with people's money and how we are dealing with things in financial markets. Hopping on the latest trends can be disastrous for us. And we need to be very, very conservative when we are dealing with other people's money. But we do need to educate people in terms of how to save and how to save for the long term um, and how to be responsible. Thank you. Thank you so much for your Mama Mama leaders. It's great, positive attitude. Um, I think Bridget said something that's very important about financial literacy and the, that we should be guided by people who actually know what they're doing. Um, so mine is going to be a comment slash statement. Firstly, you have spoken about four different financial um, prospects that one can actually go through. But as someone who does not come from a financial background, I feel that we do not understand what things like cryptocurrency may properly be. And you've mentioned that it is the new way of investments or coming through in terms of making money decisions. But Gogo, sitting there, does not know what cryptocurrency is. And I was hoping that you would go further into in a little bit more detailed. You spoke about the unit trust, but not as much as I was hoping you would because my mother next to me, she's busy asking me every day, what is it? <laughs> and then, Mama, listen, wait. You must just listen. So, my mom's not very old. My mom knows about Forex exchange, um, cryptocurrency, just a tad. But what about the, the share dealings, share portfolios? We, we are not fine. We are, let me speak for myself. I don't come from a financial background. And therefore, for someone who is trying to come into a church as a youngster and bring change, I should, even though I don't have the financial background, when I go back to my circuit, I should be able to go and stand in front and give a proper report to say, listen, these are the things that we learned. And having learned these things, can we please have financial um, people with backgrounds to come and further assist us? As a church, where are we moving to in terms of investments? But before I move into an investment in a church and society, as an individual, mm -hmm. what is the investment that I feel would be better for me? Because I cannot invest in a church if I'm not making investments for myself. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for, for the, all the comments. Please let's give them a round of applause. Um, just to touch on, on your comment, Mama, which is quite profound around change. And that is why it's important to have the conversation. Because you can never be standing in front of people and say, this is what you must do. It's a financial conversation. Remember that. Secondly, you must remember to find people in your society. I promise you, there are people in the societies who understand financial management. Bring them into the conversations. Listen to those conversations. And with that, you would change with the people. Because if you think that you're going to change alone, you will have the ones that you spoke about, the ones who abstain, the ones who are stagnant because you don't bring them to the conversations. So bring them to the conversations. Fundamentally important. Secondly, that is why maybe if I touch on, on, on the two comments is that I am, not a, I am not standing here as a financial advisor. That is why I did say I am not a financial advisor. It's a dangerous territory. I can talk to all four of them, including the real estate and land. All I am saying is that there are options out there. That's why your brother here said, Google, underline the comment, because had I have taken you through all the unit trust and what it means, it would mean that I'm giving you financial advice. I am not here to give financial advice. I am here to make your mind ponder. Remember that. So if you want to have your mind ponder, you've got Google, you've got data or a leader in the church, do your job. Read. If you can't understand that mother, which is fully understand, all you do, you find somebody in the church and say, who can provide this? Or if you can't find somebody in the church, my statement was, I've got you. When I'm saying I've got you, which means I can come to your society. But it's impossible for me to go to all the societies at a very granular level. I can do that. But it's going to be a long time. Hence, I was saying, in your societies, if you have somebody who understands financial management and financial soundness, bring them to the conversations. And maybe, and maybe, I should help the church. Always offer my service. I always say I am yours in service. Maybe we should have a conversation with the treasurers. Maybe I must have that conversation with the treasurer so that then for I am empowering those who are leading with the mothers in the church, those who are leading with the fathers in the church. Maybe that's what we should be doing. Now that we understand what is out there, it's making us scared. We shouldn't be. You are being empowered. Now move from free fear to saying, what then? And we are saying we are here to support in order to do that. I might not be the one person in your society you do have. I can promise you that. But then let's use them. Let's have the financial conversations. Very important. And that is why I did not speak in specifically about cryptocurrency, about Bitcoin, because I don't want to be in danger here. Financial advisory services... TSB, no. Here we're saying you are now empowered. What are you going to do about it? The next speaker is going to talk about a vision. The next speaker. And I'm hoping that part of that vision is these conversations that we're going to have with the treasurers because I'm going to talk to what I know best. Governance, finance, risk, and tax. That's where I come from. And societies and the circuits and the ministers, when you're in retreat, bring us so that we can empower our ministers to open unit trust accounts so that at the end of the day, they're able to take the 200 grand that they are being given and do something about it. 
But as, 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 as congregants, we want to make them feel vulnerable because we think we have the purse. Ministers, I'm able to empower you, I promise you. My husband has got a unit trust. He's a very good example. He did not understand what it means. But today he is sold. When one day you want to put tires in your car, because ministers, shame, we have, they have cars that, you know, tires, when they, they go, they all go for it once. He's able to go to his unit trust and take money for the unit trust and pay. That's empowerment. So I'm never going to give you financial advice, but mama, if you want to know about unit trust, I'm, I'm able to sit with you and we can create one today before you leave. I promise you. And put 100 rand every month. That I can do. Just a tiny sorry, before, before that, before, sorry, that I need to give my sister here. Her hand was before you. Sorry about that. Then I'm, gonna t I'm taking more time from my other speakers. I will be standing outside for financial advice. Uh, I won't waste time by greeting because everybody has greeted and ready. Thank I just you. wanted to clarity, ma'am. Uh, when you speak about e trust, especially on on a society or circuit level, no? uh, what is the church point of view about that? Remember, when the, the, the monies come into the societies, the, the process, the process or the procedures will be the money will have to go to the circuit, where the circuit is going to pay the money into the MCO. Now. The societies have got the right to fundraise for themselves. Now, I'm a little bit worried that maybe we need to get a clarity. Let's not be confused. Uh, the societies or the circuit allowed to have things like Abuma trust funds where they, 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 uh, you know, they open up such, you know, uh, things to raise their funds. Because we might find that at the end of the day, when the societies are doing that, they will be reprimanded, you know, that... This is against the, the, the book of order. We Governance. always be reminded about the book. Yes, Governance. yes. Uh -huh. So we, we need to be clear about the, what is the church saying about this unit trust thing. Okay. Uh, are we allowed to continue to do that as a society? Thank you. And, and, and you know what? God is great all the time. He will bring someone who would be able to answer specific church questions. And we have our synod treasurer sitting here. And he is going to talk to that. And remember, we are challenging the synod. We're challenging the connection on these things. And that is why I can boldly stand here and I say, challenge them. We don't want to move into E. We no longer want to be empty. So, governance done right. That question my friend here and my colleague, Lebu, will touch on it. One last one, then I close. No, I just wanted to say, uh, Sister Toby, <coughs> that's not a very easy subject, change. Now, I want to add and say, over and above the information that the person who's driving change might might be having, but mm. amongst the tools of the trade mm. is that a change agent must not only be passionate, but must also be brave. Because if he's not brave, the toxic environment that sometimes occurs in the church Leadership. will break you. Mm. <laughs> Round of applause. So on that note, I am happy to call the next speakers to talk about the importance of vision. I, I'm, I, I'm not managing the program, but maybe they might want to stand up for like a minute and just stand up. Just stand up for a minute and say to the person next to you, just stand up. <laughs> stand up. Just stand up. Then to the person next to you, to the person next to you, meet the person next to you. 
If you know the person next to you, meet the person no, behind you. I say that. <laughs> I'm bound to the field here. Never. No. <laughs> I can protect my fellow London guys. Uh-huh. 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 Uh, yes. Prince Louis had come up to Oslo. Yes. Nice of the Balmo. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Yeah. Yeah, but outside the pitch. Thank you. Now at least we managed to stand up and we circulated. Our bodies found a bit of circulation. Uh, can we have the mic so that we can introduce this, the next speakers? At break time, free of charge, financial advisory services. Thank you so much um, to our speaker. And um, if we could usher her with um, a round of applause again, please. Friends, we're quite conscious of time as well. We're not going to keep you here the whole day and the whole night. And I will swiftly just get straight into the next speaker. And um, one, one, I think, issue that has been resonating and coming up a couple of times is the bravery that we need, the courage that we need um, in trying to push this, this new revolution into the life of the church. And I should also indicate that there's ministers here. So when we talk about leadership, we're also talking about ministers. Leadership is in different levels. Um, and we call to the ministers that they would create this platform within the societies that people would come and have this kind of a conversation and that it would be a free platform to engage on um, and try to shift the gears and get into the next level of the church. Secondly, it is important to note that we, it is when we do not have an idea or a knowledge about something, we've got to be able to step back and allow other people to come in and lead us into that space, including leaders in the church. Presiding Bishop, I have no idea with issues of finance, therefore find people to come in and educate you as a presiding bishop, the district bishop, and, 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 to the last leaders of our societies. Stewards who do not have a clue on certain things must be free to invite people who are expertise onto these things to assist each other. We're doing this thing for us. There's no one person glory here. It is for the bigger church and the future of this, of this church. Our next speaker who is going to be speaking on to the importance of vision um, is the Reverend Craig um, Bell. Craig is a doctor. Um, he is my friend. I need to emphasize that he is a doctor. Yeah. He is a learned, learned person. And um, Craig is a minister now currently at the at the Melrose um, Methodist Church. He is a scholar, um, having done his doctorate in biblical languages. So if you want to know anything about Hebrew and the Greeks and everything else, you should also consult, consult Craig. Uh, Craig is a great pastor, a great visionary as well. He spent time around the connection in different societies, um, in, in leading those societies and second and drafting visions for the different um, church group. Craig is a thinker and currently serves as a member of the Connectional Finance Committee. So he is in his elements in coming to speak to us about the vision and what needs to be done next going forward. He's an experienced leader um, with an exposure and a privilege to have served in two two connections, the British and the MCSA. So ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Dr. Craig Bell. Horses have blinkers. 
And those blinkers restrict horses from a, a view that is horizontal and so allows them only to run within the spaces that is provided for them and enables them not to cross the parameters that they have been assigned to. Humanity has the ability to view broadly and can see a world from a perspective that enables them to see as far as they want to see. So I ask of you today, in the spaces of finances, how far do you see? In the spaces of what could be in your societies, what have you envisaged for it? Or are you only moving in the spaces of making it through for that particular matter? Sit with that for a brief moment. Allow yourself to see what you see. And when you see that, begin to ask yourself this question. What target do I engage? In the 16th century, they grappled with exactly the same stuff. And our founder member, Mr. John Wesley, grappled with it from a space in which he, during a time of revolution, needed to grapple both socially as well as theologically. That space was a conversation that was called, do you know it? Christian perfection. And in that space of Christian perfection, the expression of that finds itself within a space that says there is no holiness but social holiness. And so speaks of bringing two worlds together and then saying that these two worlds allow us to function because they cannot exist without each other. Your world and my world, though it's theological, may and should not exist without our deep understanding of what money means for us. Are you understanding that? Are you understanding that in those spaces, the target area that we have is a target area called people. Around here, there are no animals. Around here, there's nothing that we should be scared of. Around here is the gift of humanity. And in that gift of humanity, we come to compete in spaces of finances. So let me, let me find expression to, for that in that space. So in that space of competing, do you know that every church and every congregation competes for someone's wallet? I want you to imagine that. I want you to imagine that that which must be in your vision, and probably I don't even own a wallet, but I have other spaces by which I access my funds. And sometimes I walk around with my bag, and in my bag where my laptop is in, if I scratch long enough, and it's a similar experience for every lady in this room, there might be something in there that speaks to the financial world that we live in, correct? And in that same space, in that same space, the competition that we have is a competition that says, how do people spend their money and what will they spend it on? So if I ask you today, what 
will you spend your funds on today? What would that be? So if you had 100 bucks for this weekend, how would you spend it? Companies, big companies out there, and I'm going to use Coca-Cola. Big companies out there hold the same conversation. They say that if people is the real commodity, and if people is the real target, how do we tap into how people spend their money? And they did an exercise, Coca-Cola, and Coca-Cola's exercise is the following. They recognize that the very last week of every month, they have a 50% drop in sales. Do people drink less Coca-Cola in the last week? Hey? So what is the problem? This is engaging. I'm needing you to engage me. So what is the problem? I give you 200 rand if you find this answer. I'm not going to go as high as Graham. <laughs> Competitors? They don't have any money? The month is longer? Do you remember that ad of the last, month's, the last day of the month snack? And the feature and the look of that just is completely different. Isn't that so? So let me ask you, what is it that Coca-Cola competes with during the last Friday of the end of the month? If they got to yesterday, what would they be battling with? <laughs> Alcohol? Is Graham still here? <laughs> Graham, what would you say they battle with? Help us. He Googled it. He's sitting in front of a laptop. <laughs> and he has a big apple. So what if I say to you, if you have an option between buying Coca-Cola and data, what would you buy? Data. <laughs> so who's the competition? Data. So let me ask you if that is true, if the issue is that, if the issue is data, how does that affect your world? And how does that affect my world? Because it's definitely data. I can tell you here and now, I would not buy Coca-Cola in the last week of the month because by the last week of the month, I would have run out of my data on my account. And that means I want to stay connected. I want to speak to people. I want to tap into resources. And therefore, it means if I spend my last 15 bucks, I would spend it on data anytime. Would you agree? So do you see this concept? That this concept speaks about competitiveness within the area of expenditure. Within the spaces of how we spend. <laughs> There's a challenge in both of those worlds. Do you remember what the challenge is? Let me give you the challenge. That prior to a certain period, was what percentage? And now? How does that affect data? So previously, for Vodacom, you could buy nine rand worth of data. Correct? I want you to see what economics does to how we spend. So with that, now being 15%, what would the cheapest data cost you now? If we're working on a premise of nine bucks, then. Hey? 
1% less. So therefore it means, so see consumerism. Therefore it would mean from a perspective of consumerism that you would now no longer spend 9 rand 99 because that's what consumers do. You would now spend 10 rand 10 cents. And what if you only have 10 rand? I'm needing for you to think critically about this. And as you think critically about this, do you see the impact that that has had on the market of expenditure? And in the market of expenditure, do you therefore understand how critical it is when we make that last week of the month decision? I can always have a bottle of Coca-Cola the week thereafter. But that which is critical for a particular time in a particular season is that I stay connected. How do we relate that conversation to what we're talking about today? How do we relate to the fact that we have a target market? We need to understand that our target market speaks specifically about the fact that if we don't know our product, we can't sell that to people. Do you see that? So I'm really speaking to you as congregants, whether you know your product and whether you know what you get from your society and whether you can market that. So those are real conversations I'm having with you. I'm having conversations with you in terms of from the moment you're having, you're having a brainstorm around budgeting whether you're actually understanding what you're doing. So let me reinterpret that conversation for you. So as I reinterpret that conversation for you, it's easy to put figures and say we need this amount of money for the ensuing year. Isn't that so? This is the problem with that concept. That concept would simply mean that you have not fully understood that it's not so much about the budget, but it's about what you're selling in that budget. I'm going to do a case study for you. No, no, no. It doesn't want to go there. I'm looking for the one that says Melrose, Melrose example. So I get to Melrose. So this is a vulnerable space of having that conversation because I'm still their minister. But it's vital that I use that example. So I get to Melrose, and Melrose has a finance committee, and they have society stewards, and now I'm really battling to put these two things together because they function so uniquely different. Isn't that so? Right? And the finance committee says to the stewards, we haven't budgeted for that. Have you been in those conversations? Have you been a young person in a youth movement and they say to you, you have not budgeted for that? It's sickening. Get behind me, Satan. Because that conversation is a startling conversation that speaks to the fact that our finances should not speak into our vision, but our vision should speak to our finances. Am I making sense to you? So we went through this space at Melrose where I'm realizing that Melrose is, is a... What's the word for Melrose? What kind of community would they be? Um, privileged community. And in a privileged community, um, we simply speak because, you know, the money is there. But for Melrose, somehow, that became challenging because it was no longer like that. But that which was important for Melrose to understand is that unless the people know the vision, they will not buy into it. So this is a conversation I'm now needing to have with you. Any finance committee members here? 
just a show of hands. Any society steward members here? Any congregants here? It's important that you note how we shift paradigms from being a congregant to now being a society steward. It's them and us. From finance meeting to society stewards, there's almost a space that the society steward is not even in the finance committee. And so because we're not networking we're not understanding how the puzzle comes together. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing and are you beginning to understand that the biggest thing in our conversation about finances is putting the puzzle together? And when we fail to communicate in the way that we ought to communicate, we don't get the full picture. We don't get the full picture. So in fighting for the wallets of people. We go through this exercise and they say, cut these expenses. Was it a good conversation to have? Was it a good conversation to say, let's cut the expenditure? We've done the budget. So it therefore means that the budget is already defined. So what's the problem? It's not about cutting what we're spending. What's the problem? The people don't know why we're spending it. And so suddenly they challenged me. And they said to me, it's time. You have a completely different sermon. It's time you have an interactive sermon. And I'm thinking, oh my soul. This is taking me out of my comfort zone. There is no way I'm going to be able to preach and at the same time having, I'm not going to cope with this. And they throw me into the deep end. And that which is peculiar is that I had come to Melrose and said to them, I, want, I would really like to lead you within this framework. And the framework that I would like to lead you into is I want to lead you into the five imperatives of a fruitful congregation. Do you know that? And I take them through five imperatives of a fruitful congregation. But I only did that for the leaders, and the congregation knew nothing about what the five imperatives of a fruitful congregation was about. And so suddenly, one Sunday morning, we had five, imperatives all over the show, and it was no longer in this style. It was in little groups, and people started talking about that. And as people talked about that and gave meaning and impetus to what it meant to have a radical this and an extravagant that, and a, what are they? I have one of my society stewards here. What are they? So risk-taking mission, you know, so for me, risk-taking mission was someone knocking on our door and we knew that, that this person coming from the street might just be a person that's going to take us for a ride, but we said we're going to take risks. And suddenly I needed to teach my leaders what it meant to take risks. That even, I, even though I had to take that risk because I said that you are worthy for me to take a risk. Are you understanding that? That irrespective of the spaces that I had found myself to be able to say, you know what, this shouldn't be. I took risk. I spoke about passionate worship, a church that needed to worship passionately. And here I was in a space with a church that was dramatically white in its formation. And so suddenly, we needed to hear 
that there were people from other groupings. And imagine what it felt like when I said, now we're going to sing Zulu. And now we're going to sing Sutu. Imagine, imagine in a space of English, someone hearing, huh? Yeah. Imagine in a space of someone hearing out of nowhere, Imbajwale o Fedile. Imagine, imagine that. Imagine that. When in a space of then needing to teach and say, you know what, in simplest form, I need your touch. Making that which we want to achieve known to the people. So the space of your finance is not that radical. But the space of your conversation becomes important. Because when we fail to communicate what we're trying to do, people will not buy in. Are you getting that? Are you getting that the problem is not so much that people don't want to give? Remember, we're fighting for people's wallets, but when they know what they're spending it on, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. So do you know what your church is about? And have you bought in as a leader to what your leader is leading you to? Because when you fail to buy in, when you fail to buy in to where your minister is taking you to, because remember, you've said you want to be led. Right? And there is team leadership. So part of what we did in this was to say we could have had just lay people talking, but we also said there's something called within the Methodist Church that says recognizing every member's ministry. And there is laity, and there is clergy. And this combustion needs to come together and explode. And that's what makes it powerful. So in the space of that, in terms of the vision, in the space of taking that which is technologically advanced and moving, how do we, how do we get to a space where we get the engines to move? And we have different people doing different things from the first industrial revolution, where everybody knows, you know, I'm the door steward, and I'm doing my door duty. And I'm the poor fun steward, and I know there must be, and it's not about giving money, it's about the fact that we have people that need us to invest into their lives because ulambile. Or maybe they have nothing else. And so we speak into the context of a text that says, feed the hungry, care for the this, do to the that. And so we give expression within that space. And then we find another space and we say, okay, there's, there's poor fine stewards, there's society stewards. And then within the context of the framework, of, of our vernacular societies, there's ukosa, and then there is the class leader. And even though that wasn't the intent, but we know that even the class leader have, has a role to compete for your money. Because the class leader, umkokeli, is going to say to you, eh, 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 tawe. there is this and this and this, CIN's are get pie. And because CIN's are get le no lo no lo, we cannot do this without competing for what is a kicking. Are you with me? 
So do you see that the essence of our conversations is not how much is in our person what we don't have, but how much we know and how much we express what we're giving for what. Do you know why there's a discourse between Umanyane, Neka? Because the conversations at Manyano are different. In Totanamna. Are you understanding that? So I know how I communicate it in the spaces of Kopano. I, I know how I communicate. And in that space, I say, this is what we're doing with that. And so the people in the Manianos know what we're doing with their money. Because we give it tangibility. We give it tangibility. In the church, the conversation is simply, hey, there's none. But we never say why. And we never are transparent. So at Melrose, we went through this exercise and within from one month saying to people, this is what we're doing. From working on expenditure, exceeding our income, within one conversation, we went from the other way. People knew what we were doing because we now were transparent. We gave them a vision that says, this is what we're doing. This is the outcome of that. Are you, are you getting that? Are you understanding in the spaces of when we... We were talking earlier on, and there was a word that, that, that you were using, Graham, at the very last ga game, what? Game? Gamification. gamification. Do you know what's the best example of gamification? Chona. Chona. There's none different. <laughs> if, if our church needs to examine where do we do this gamification, chona. Now, what is even worse about that expression of that word is that to means when you sleep. So find the reality of what our forefathers and mothers meant. The space of dreaming so deeply that it becomes a worthwhile reality. Vision. Are you understanding that? So let me ask you, in the spaces of financing of our church. Or, so that you echo the words of some of the different theologies in the hymn writer when you say, Andinanto es andinsan. Or when you deeply are embedded and engraved into spaces that says, um, hey, kwelenyang, zaupala lanjenga mans. Are you getting me? Are you understanding that I'm expressing to you that even within the space of our theology, we can either narrow our paradigms or we can broaden our paradigms so that we understand that it shouldn't be sinful for a man of the cloth to be able to say, today we speak about money. Because that is a Jesus conversation. Imagine Jesus holding a conversation about taxes. Do you remember the conversation that Jesus held about taxes? Hey, do you remember that conversation? What's the conversation? And if I have to ask you, Jesus showing a practical implication, what would that be in the text? Where Jesus shows us, even if it means you need to do that in order to pay taxes, what would that be in the Bible? Do you remember in the argument of paying the tax, 
Jesus says, there's a fish in this water. Catch it. And in that fish's mouth, there is a coin. When you find the coin, so it's calling for an exercise. It's calling for an engagement. It's calling for a risk. And then it calls us to be bold. And in us then being bold, we meet that which needs to be met. Are we still bold? Are we still hearing Jesus say to us, maybe the finances are not in your pocket. Maybe it's in the water. And when you get into the water, start looking for the fish. And when you've caught the fish, investigate it deeply. Cremora has this ad. And Cremora says, as the man, you know, sometimes men just can't do certain things. And he walks in the kitchen at night, late at night. And he says, and there's no cremora in the refrigerator. And Anne answers from the bedroom. And she says, it's not inside, it's on top. And he, totally annoyed by Anne, then in disgust, mimics her and says, not inside, it's on top. Where's your vision? Are you looking for cremoira in the refrigerator? Or can you lift your eye to a different space and a different time, even if it comes with ridicule and mimicking? Where are we? So if this church was the church that I still believe in. So one of the things of my ordination is that my ordination, not even my ordination, that my candidature spoke into a space that says, will you go? Will you go? Help me. Where you are sent. If I... So we've had many conversations around parity, remember. Parity of stipends, parity of this, and I'm one of those who will not support parity of stipend, and I make no, and I make no secret of that. Because if this church was doing its work the way it ought to do it, then this church will allow that minister to answer that in the affirmative, but find the provision to even if that minister had to be sent to Kuteng or ukum, or o pitsoner water. Right? Then this church, in its connectionality, will provide for the minister in its most awkward space. And that would be parity. And this church, whom I love, who then say to those who have, Sell what you have and give it to the poor. I was watching I was watching a film of of, of post crucifixion and of how they managed to perform their ministries. It was all about people selling and giving it so that a ministry could be enacted. So just in this room, if I ask you today, what do you have right there, right now, if we could create a pool, would you have any to put in there? Or would you be like Ananias and Sapphira and keep a part for yourself? 
Because that's not Jesus. And that's not the Jesus who calls followers into his kingdom. And the problem with our finances is we still hide. Tinem fila. You know? So either we put a little bit there, and we put a little bit there, and we put a little bit there, and if that doesn't work, we put a little bit there. And we even say, no, you can look. There's nothing. Good. Nothing. But up and fish when Are you getting this? Are you getting the space of what we do with the resources that God has blessed us with? Are you, are you following the heart of this? So let me go back. What if the poorest of the poorest church in our connection, do you know where that is, Bongi? Of the poorest circuit in our connection of society. Now that's relative. Mozambique could be, but I know in South Africa there's very many poor. You know, just if I think of formal language, and I'm going to use this language for the sake of the exercise, homelands. <laughs> and think about that space. And that if imagine those societies, because this is what happens. I used to be, <laughs> this mama reminded me that over 20 years back, I buried her son. I'd forgotten. And then when I looked at her, it suddenly dawned upon me. Oh, Vela was say, um to was say, Dela, a forge gold. You know? Then I remembered. But it was years back. And I remember that context that though all the people there are here, they go home. So immediately I thought, oh, like Utata Lion. That, that is from there, but I remember Eunice, the late, his wife, she was from their homeland. And by the time she went back there, there was nothing. And she'd spend all her money of in-service working, yeah, at Jaws. And the time came when she needed to retire, good day. And those are the forgotten spaces in our, in our connection. And what if, what if, what if we had something in place that could speak to that so that we could say like MTN says, I've got you. Wherever you go. Wherever you go. Hey? Eh? What if? Just what if? What if our vision for finances really speaks deeply about the space of our spirituality? What if our vision for finances really speaks deeply about our own convictions of church? So let me ask you, how many of you are watching T.D. Jakes? Nothing wrong to watch it. So this is my challenge I've just figured out, you know, this is a connection. And I've just figured out that you are Chris's daughter. <laughs> yeah, it's a small connection. Hey, imagine. I know your father, and then suddenly this child is talking, and I'm like, okay. Huh? Where, which circuit are you in? Where are you now? Which? Joburg what? Right? And then I remember that your father is in Meadowlands. You know, just connectionality. Um, but imagine, imagine if you who are all watching all these other pastors 
who are investing that much in your local minister and followed him and supported him and engaged time and, and, and said, you know, I've watched, but can I critique? Imagine that. So let me check with you. Whom among you follow your local church? Whom among you, in whatever space, follow your local church? A platform, support your local church. Whom among you support your local minister? Because if you do not see that agent of God worthy to be supported, you should not be there. You should not be there. I can't get that in now. Um, I want to conclude and I'm going to call you, sir. I, I might not have spoken that, that broadly about vision, but what I have done for you is for you to see how much, how much your church's finances and the continuance of who we are as a people called Methodists rely on each one of us. Do you see that? Do you have any questions? <clears throat> Hello? Oh, it's on. Okay. Do you have any questions up to now? I'm going to go back to that question that was posed in terms of does the church, does the church allow us to, to engage financial investment in particular areas or not? Do you want to answer it or do you want me to do that? So our church has no policy on those kind of governance currently, and we know that. But this platform allows us to be able to say to our church, create that governance. Put in place people of financial repute that can create a new space of information feed, that will allow us to think cognitively and act with conscience. That's the space that this platform is inviting us to do. To be able to say, what capacities do we need? What governance practices do we need to put in place? And how do we make this part of the order of our, our book? Have I answered you? Um, because though we are connectional, we are also societal. So that communal individualism is all part of the stake. Um, and we all often find that at society level, we do our own thing. But in essence, we're a connectional church. So if we're a connectional church communications officer, um, then we want to do this thing that, that speaks to the innateness of us as a connectional body. Any other question? Comments? In mic, the roaming mic, Ukona, Uten. Yeah, Hona. Thank you. My name is Nam Sam from a small society in the south called South Hills. I'm quite excited to be here. My first remark is I'm feeling very bad that there's people that are missing out on such a beautiful presentation. And from my background, I look at gaps and I pick up the gap here is we too high level. And when you too high level and you move with things that are so important and those gaps and cracks, people fall through those and you leave, you might even leave the important people. Why am I saying that? I got this invite via WhatsApp 
And when it reached, it reached my church, it was positioned, but it was quite too high level. Um, where I am a member, I probably am looked at as a high level person. Then I was pushed that I need to attend this. Now that's a danger. If I'm supposed to go back and say, we're supposed to change, and they're going to look at me and think, about your child, I'm gonna so it to obey me again. So I'm I'm pleading that can we please go three notches down so that we don't leave so many people behind. This house is too big. Craig said we were testing. I appreciate that we're testing, and I I fully request that we go a, a second test workshop again. Now we go a level notch lower than this high level presentations. And now we simplify everything so that we get the masses so that when we send people for this change and this invitation, they are excited because they're going to an environment that they will be well received. And uh, coming on the investments, very excited. I can give advice, but who am I giving this advice to? Are they really equipped to work with me on that path? So that is another gap. And when you look at the cracks that we're having in the church, especially in the finance space, there is so many cracks that before we could even say change, we're going investment routes and everything, let's close the cracks. There is monies that are falling through cracks into pockets. So maybe if we're going unit trust, then you have an umbrella that says this is held at high level. And if my society goes in, they go in via the high level and it's managed and, and, and support it up there so that it doesn't have my name. Because if I say I'm investing in unit trust, they said, of course. So the gaps. So again, you're saying that we need to streamline that, that which we do in terms of our governance and in terms of our operations. And we still have not streamlined. Definitely that. And uh, where I, I am I'm a member, it's like whenever I go to Robert Chem, I feel like um, I envy them. And if I'm spiritually uh, weak, I'm going to leave my church and say, I want to go to the bigger church. And I want to go to that church because it's beautiful. And my kids can play in the yard and all of that. And it is quite the opposite in my work environment. When I visit the branch, they envy me. I come from head office. And I said to, to the head office, this is ridiculous. You guys are sitting with the money and we look different out there. Why aren't we uniformed? Now I'm saying to my church, why is my church looking like it's ready to close down anytime? I've been there for five years and the geezer hasn't been working. Why is it that when I go to Robert Chem, I can have a cup of coffee and sit down and have, and this it's the same Methodist church. Why is the church money not centrally managed? Why am I supposed to have a, a, a what do you call it, a fundraising so that I can have a bonus for my minister? Why is my minister different from the minister from the centralization of things? We'll cut the whole thing. We'll even cut the noise that we're hearing when ministers not wanting to go where, they don't want to go there because there's no money. So let, 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 let's look at the things central and then we will somehow get the answers. Let me, let me just say that we do have a listening committee that's here and they are putting stuff together and we will still give them a chance. Was there any other? Yeah. Um, question. You spoke about something that I've always felt deeply about. <laughs> Things that we give names um, do they dictate the vision and the implications thereof? You spoke about the concept of Ukhon, and in the lit and in the literal sense, it would mean asleep. And I come from a circuit where this is the time where the church becomes empty. During this season, that's the time where people are not at church. That's the time where people struggle to even come to terms with the concept of Ukhon. And you'd be right to say they're at home asleep. So my, my, my question there is, is when we look at vision, 
is what is the names that we give, is how we articulate the, because I think in, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense, it's a vision, it's, 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 it's a mission statement of sorts, financially. So is, it, is, is the things that we give names to, um, the response we get as leaders, a reflection of what we initially gave uh, the names to? I don't know if I'm making sense. Um, understanding where you're coming from, because we know, remember, f fourth industrial revolution is asking what's working, and it's not only in digital space, but it's also asking what's not working. So let's say within the spaces of communication and language limitations, that we then also need to look at what in terms of the expressions of our language um, hold value still, and what no longer holds value. Um, there are deep conversations within levels of um, people referring to um, the leaders of our church as stewards, and in other spaces they may call it something else, because the word in itself has such a strong, heavy connotation that it can either weigh you down or elevate it. So maybe that gives understanding of what maybe we speak about when we are, when we are doing umno piso. So when we do umno piso, there is a space when we mo piso, and we say some of these things, some of these things. So that is fourth industrial revolution. To be able to say that in the space that we find ourselves, even within our language and our expressions, are they bringing us up? Or are they taking us down? So it's a vital conversation. It's a conversation that, that precisely what you are talking about earlier on in terms of these 12 people, and I'm just using that vaguely, should grapple with in terms of our what's in terms of our expressions within the church and whether they are still relevant. And so maybe go through um, all of that stuff and say, does this speak to a community and a society of today? And is this still relevant? I think if I had to find conclusion to that reference, I would say one of the things that Mr. Wesley says, I don't fear that Methodism would become a dying sect in itself. But I fear that. Do you want to conclude? What does he fear? That it? That it? That they will become a people without power. Of the spirit, there are three, three things of doctrine and of? I'm making that point and I'm doing that deliberately because I want you to see how we've not looked into our history. So that our present state is not enriched to its fullness because we've not reflected. Do you see that? Do you see that? We have great narrators of stuff. And we've become poor in who we are. Another comment? Uh, thanks. I'm Thomas Makhali. Uh, I remember Graham was speaking about things that will not change uh, you know, in, in the church. Now my remark and, and uh, action going forward. Uh, what I realized is sometimes it seems we are afraid as a church to be bold in when we, uh, you know, like we, we look for stewards, we look for uh, people in leadership. Uh, we seem to be afraid to profile those people and to provide the, the challenge that we've got. I think it's, uh, the church must take a position perhaps through the finance committee 
to, to encourage societies and circuits uh, to, to profile anything, uh, any position, any uh, uh, you know, um, thing that we want to do. So that we must really be sure that if Thomas is going to be perhaps nominated to be a, a treasurer or a, or a sect steward, we must know what is Thomas going to do there. It does not help uh, you one person who's got leadership qualities, but you're going to take a person who does not have anything to do there. That's my comment. Thanks. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, for, for me, the, probably the biggest takeaway from uh, today is that the era of fourth industrial revolution is essentially giving us an opportunity to, um, you know, reimagine and see how we can do things better. And it, it really starts even with the kind of people that we have in, in various um, positions. But, but equally so, um, what we've spoken about today is, you know, having that uh, spirit of risk taking and not being too comfortable. Um, in a sense, maybe a bit old fashioned um, to try and get people that are tried and tested essentially, but to also have a look at, you know, um, uh, and Reverend spoke about it earlier that we, <laughs> we essentially get rid of the box. Um, I, 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 in my uh, background of uh, accounting, they say accountants don't make good business leaders because we are always looking at risk, we are always looking at what could go wrong. And so as much as you know, sometimes we can uh, want to get those kind of right skills, uh, but there must be that element of experimenting, that element of uh, us wanting to be uh, adventurous and, and not being too safe, you know. Um, and I think that's really what 4IR is inviting us to, to have that kind of uh, spirit, uh, you know, of being brave and, and, and going to, to do things differently. So um, I do agree, let's, let's have a look at, you know, what kind of people uh, are we looking at to be, you know, amongst those that lead, but um, a little bit of experimenting also won't harm. Um, and I think it's something that we would need to uh, embrace entirely uh, uh, as the church. Any other? Yes, sir. Greg, I'm just thinking, because it's already that I'm having a young boy who wants to start the job. Any discussion with him, we must be thinking. We must be thinking. But we shouldn't say right from the beginning that this is an, the start of the conversation in trying to influence the discourse mm -hmm. of the church. And I'm intrigued with the kind of the language that she's using, the gaps. We're sitting here, we will be seeing the gaps, but we should approach it with the attitude that how do I fill the gap, even from this side of the house, um, with no thinking that the presenters for today, the presenters for today have got it all. Um, we will continue to engage. If there's anyone, even within this group, even in the extension of the church, who we think can be able to contribute in this level. Please volunteer people. Please volunteer yourself into this space um, so that this thing would be a collective effort. We would move together. Um, so this is just the beginning. And I'm glad that these are people from my circuit. We've started the conversation already in the circuit. So the circuit is going to be your experiment. You can come to us. In fact, this is my second it. Yes, tell them to come to us if they want to, to see what we've already done. Any other? Because we've, we, um, Charles. Thanks. You see, he called me Uncle Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, from from my perspective, just you know, uh, I think Graham spoke about those over fifty-five, the baby boomers, and uh, I remember he did some work at Ford Motor Company on the CVP program about this as well. 
my fears. Let me. Ju- I just want to mention some of the fears of my age. Are you taking away my connectedness to other human beings? <sighs> when what was the lady's name? Eli- the, that little button thing from Amazon, Alex- Alexia. Okay, <laughs> about personalizing your health care. I want somebody to know me, my psyche, who I am, not my symptoms and this and that and the other. I'm speaking about my fears, yeah, and I'm being open about that. You know, I, I, I want to connect with somebody. We have all these phone calls, they want to sell me something on the phone, insurance, and you add this and this. I say to them straight, sorry, come and see me. No, but we don't see you. I said, then I'm sorry, I do, do not buy such things over the phone. I need to connect with you, who you are, etc. So that's a fear that I have in this. All. I, I mean, all this, it's, it's great stuff, but I want to, do you know me? And then uh, uh, the other thing that I, I, I want to speak about, just, it was interesting, I think it was Amazon as well. The most successful companies, they don't really protect their brand. Everything can be sold from the one plat- platform. And I'm also connected into the motor industry and the premium brands, and it's all about protecting the brand. Billions are spent on protecting the brand. And it just led me to, to, to ask myself, are we maybe not too protective of what we regard as Methodism? Are we just interested in protecting this thing that we call Methodism? Is there not something bigger, the kingdom of God? And that was just something, you know, move out of that, protecting just Methodism. Thank you. I think if there's anything that we have done positive in Charles's life um, is to reconvict him on his value system. And I speak to Charles directly to that because I know him for many years um, and has been his conversation then and I'm hearing him now have that same conversation that what is out there that's bigger than Methodism. And, And I'm glad that if it has done nothing else, that it puts you back into that framework of speaking to the kingdom of God again. And I'll be excited to hear that. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Blue from Matlosana Circuit. Um, I just wanted to tap on the competition of the wallet. Um, One thing that I've observed in my circuit, specifically in a certain society, is that when it comes to Juana, the church is empty because we don't even understand what are we giving for. It's just that hai ki khona, ki khona assessment, assessment. But every year we have a Thanksgiving service during December and we make close to 100,000. What happens in that service is that they take your accountants, one side, you take your department of health, one side, and it's a competition. But my biggest fear is that we are losing the value of that service. It becomes this competition and then we we, we make the money, which is a good thing. Assessments will be paid. But at the end of the day, we lose the meaning of thanksgiving and we we just change it to something that we we, we go into raise funds and we will have enough money to pay assessments. But what is the message behind thanksgiving? So I think what we need to do in terms of honor, we need to understand what is honor. I, for one, as a circus steward, don't even understand what is horn. I just know that I have to be there. My class leader, 100 rand, I'll take out the 100 rand. But what is this horn? Perhaps there is a deeper meaning, it's just that we don't understand it yet. So the point that you're making is the educational point. Yes. And so in the educational po- point, it's all about learn, unlearn, and relearn. And so that's precisely what we've aimed to do today, is to say to you, what do we need to unlearn in terms of the brand of just Methodism and what do we need to learn in terms of who we are within the kingdom of God? 
And what do we need to relearn in terms of that which we've come into? And, and maybe spaces, I don't know how these spaces are created, of, of saying to our people, let's give meaning to what we do and unpack that meaning and find for our people that it's not just lost in semantics, but that it is rooted in something that's so life-giving. Um, maybe the space creates that. Is there a final one? Yes, Dada. My name is Lebohang Mabilo from Khalisekek. Uh, I am challenged by this conference or this workshop. So uh, I, I have been challenged to ride the bicycle. And I want to unlearn old ways. So my question or my, my, my worry is, am I now in this lesson going to be, instead of turning left, uh, I must then face to the right so that I can turn left. I, I, is the unlearning part, a, to me it's a problem because when I, I, I fall to the right, I must wake up and try to move towards the left. So as a church, we, we seem to be falling. Uh, do I, am I saying right when I say, now that I was, I was going to turn to right, for me to turn to right, I must move to the left? You know, it sort of confuses me. That's my little problem. I, I know it, it, could, it was not your presentation, but that's what Graham said. And uh, this whole uh, workshop is about unlearning way, old ways and learning new things, you know. That's where I am. But what Graham also said, and this is important, is what is there that can stay? What is there that's perfect? And, I, and we know not all things are perfect. And how? So all he's asking or all, the con all that the conversation is asking is how do we embellish that that already works? So it doesn't always have to be in the principle of, <laughs> of this mechanism. Because sometimes, in order to make this right again, we need to remove this mechanism and put it back to what it's meant to be. So sometimes, the problem is not riding the bicycle, but finding what's an, what is enabling us not to ride it, and then ride it. So, there are moments that we need to find new ways of doing it. There are other moments that we need to say, eh, are you understanding that? Are you understanding that? So fourth industrial revolution is not only about finding the spaces where it invites new thinking. But looking at an old bicycle and saying, what did they put here that's new? And this thing that they've put here that's new. Are you with me? Do we, can we come to a close? Yes, sir. There's, there's Uma Kula as well, this side. We have rushed against uh, time. Craig, this is not a question. I was just now trying to check, as uh, Reverend Bonoiva said. I was thinking maybe Lebu will finish the presentation and we get maybe questions to wrap up. Because as we are doing now, 
In the interest of time, I have come here because I know that my one will be out. And there is something that I want to know. I'm not a person who likes to, to leave things in between, as if now we are disrespectful as a minister, for that matter. So I, I don't want to say I, I, I put in my weight in whatever is done, but this is my humble request that we go that way. So let's move forward and faster. Lebo, yes. would you take us to the next steps? Yeah, um, thanks. I think the, the message is, is, is quite clear on, on our side that, you know, we, in the era of fourth industrial revolution, are essentially looking how we can best use, you know, existing technology to um, help us to better do church, and to better do other aspects, perhaps in our uh, personal lives. And so I've just jotted down here a couple of things which I think will be critical, you know, for us to um, consider, you know, as, as the next steps. And, and, and I want to start with the last presentation that we had today, um, the one about uh, vision. So, I think it's quite clear um, that more and more of our people are getting access to the, you know, the internet, to technology, and to um, and and with the introduction of, you know, or rather opening up of the spectrum, that you're gonna have more and more people um, having access, you know, to 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 the internet and everything that gets done on the internet. And what will have to be critical for us is to make sure that equally so, you know, church remains uh, appealing. Um, that if people are not going to buy Coca-Cola, instead of them buying data, we want them to invest in the church. You know, so the church has to be in a space where it can reinvent itself and realize that, you know, when we talk competition of the wallet, it's exactly that. That unless people can identify with the vision of the church, then it will be difficult to, um, you know, then get that much needed investment in the church. And, and so for me, that would be the first takeaway for us today is to say we, we've been given an opportunity to reimagine church and to go and think of a vision of the kind of church that we want. And then uh, secondly, then to see how technology can assist us with that, the church that will talk to people's needs. Um, there were some good ideas, uh, you know, mentioned earlier in terms of how we can minister, you know, um, to, to people through the use of technology. As, as things stand today, um, Mam Tuli and I have been checking since the morning that there's a whole lot of people, maybe 40 or so that we saw were actively following today's presentation. Um, so we, we have to be aware that there's more people that we can reach through the use of technology. And so it even talks to how we go about with our finances. Um, and, 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 and then the second thing maybe uh, over and above the vision is around uh, asset building. Um, and, 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 and asset building in a form of financial assets. And we've, we've been given examples of, you know, uh, easy assets that we, that we can go into. Um, unit trusts are the easiest that you can uh, go into, I similarly had, uh, you know, started unit trust about 15 years ago and still going. Um, and there's really no reason why the church can't, uh, you know, do something similar where we build an asset base um, uh, from which we can do whatever we want uh, in the future. And in building these assets, and, 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 and now we're going to talk experimenting. Um, we're not saying take all your money into something that you may feel is risky. You know, you might want to put 
a small portion of it, uh, um, you know, a risk that you may feel is manageable and not take all your resources and throw them into a particular asset. But to take and go and experiment with a small portion, you know, if it returns good, or if it brings good returns to you, you know, in the following year, you can then increase that. So I think let's be aware that we're not going to make a meaningful uh, change um, uh, if, if we don't, you know, uh, go and experiment and take that risk. So we should really be all about risk uh, taking. And, 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 and then part of the opening, you know, comments from, from today was, as the church, we are ministering to people that are already living this type of lifestyle in the fourth industrial revolution. We are ministering to people that are using some of these you know, financial products and all of that. And so you don't want to be left behind and not know what your people are being exposed to on a daily basis. And so we need to invest you know, in, in that kind of education in ourselves as well. Uh, personal finance, uh, talking to investments as well. Those are the kind of things that we need to um, to look at, you know, as as next steps. If um, our congregants are able to equally build certain assets, then in return the the church is going to um, to benefit from that. And with the introduction of the new spectrum, as I said, what we will see then is more and more people will have easy access to getting data on their phones and on their smartphones. Um, so for me, that means that, you know, the ground is really fertile for us to try some sort of different ways of ministering. And um, because we would know we've got a bigger pool of people um, that, we, that, 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 that essentially we, we can reach. So those are the kind of things I think we need to, to look at as, as uh, next steps uh, on our side. Uh, as Grant said earlier, the technology is there. We are not inventing anything new, but we're just imagining you know, a different church and how the church can then maximize the use of existing technologies. And that's really where we need to, to push ourselves. And really what we are doing today you know, as the Synod leadership is to plant a seed um, to, 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 to you as leaders from various societies and circuits to say this is what is available. The next step is for you to start having these conversations uh, with your people. And trust me, there's a lot of people in your societies that are very active in this space. Uh, it's not something that you really have to wait for the bishop or myself to come and you know, introduce that conversation in your society. Um, you, know, you, you, you just call your congregants. And, and, and similar to what uh, Craig was saying about Melrose to say, this is the kind of church that we want. And people will bring in their ideas. They'll tell you how they think you can better use WhatsApp for that kind of con community because whatever interventions we do, the next steps that we do, they all are dependent on a particular context. You know? So we can't bring a one size uh, fits all type of approach. It has to work for a community in Alexandra, in Soweto. So you will need those inputs you know, from our various congregants. So I think let's, let's, let's look at that as um, you know, the next steps and, and things to do um, of really how to take advantage of you know, existing technologies and how we can do uh, church better and reimagine uh, church essentially. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, yeah, I, I do need to be brave as well. Yeah, all right. When we're going to wrap up now, I did have a listening committee that is just going to say what did we, uh, they hear and how do they share the message so that we take something with, uh, with us. And whatever the presentation that we had done today we will be shared with people that have given their contacts outside when we're signing up. So I'm going to hand over to Mfundisukim just to take us, take us through what they hear. I'm going to be very brief. I know some of us need to go. Um, 
So I'm going to speak about some of the things we learnt, and it's just a paragraph. We learnt about the rite of passage of the Industrial Revolutions. We heard truth that we are out of date and arrogant. We heard that our church is dying, but the words came like resurrection, even though it spoke of death. We heard as leaders we need to be deliberate in understanding what the fourth revolution is about. It's about unlearning and learning again, not business as usual. But what God is calling us to do, and that God is calling us to this new rebirth. We heard that there are many levels to the fourth industrial revolution, connect, collaborate, curiosity, experiment, unlearn, learn, beyond our traditional boundaries for each one of us. We heard about being one church and we heard it powerfully. Leadership is about allowing ourselves to step back at times and be led. And we heard about planting the seeds financially for the long term. Change needs bravery and courage. The spirit of risk taking and to reimagine how we do church and who we are as church. Getting rid of the box. Leaders arise, look boldly at the gaps and stand in them. This is just the beginning. Can Jesus spoke a word from God right at the beginning, before the presentations were given. And she said this, as the church, we are prophets of God. Do not be afraid. Let the resurrection begin. Amen. Yes. Thank you very much, listening team. Um, we will have uh, then that taken to the powers be to discuss and take it forward. Um, I do want now to wrap up and extend a word of thank to the AV team and the Grace Point um, for being able to really stream live what we have today. And we thank the audience at home that are watching and they've been communicating online, asking questions and all that. Um, so it's nice that it's not just the synod central that is having this conversation, but it is in the connection and other churches as well. So we, we're happy. We're happy as well as Central Synod to be the ones that are following the call from the presiding bishop. Um, now we are going to be sending in the communication, as I said, and I do want to thank the team that when God gave me, I don't like to use uh, with me, but when, when, when this was, it's been worrying me, how the finances of the church has been working and the cry and the lack and everything, eventually I said, we do need to do something. And luckily enough, and uh, I managed to get the team that you've seen, uh, we got Graham, we got Mfundisu uh, Bell, we got Mfundisu Bonoi, we got Usi Tobeka, that's a team that we established just to kickstart the conversation. So this is not a closed up team, it is open now to co-opt people to move forward because as four or five of us, or no, no put label, will not be able to really kickstart the whole thing for the Synod. But it's open now to move forward as uh, societies, as circuits, uh, we need to open that engagement and, 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 and it, this, the, the, the presentation, the aim of it is that we need to take it back home so that we go and, pack and, and unpack it and discuss around it. So it's not a closed session, it is the beginning of it going forward. Yeah, and then we're going to take benediction, but I need Mfundisi to do, uh, Mfundisi Ngom, uh, to come forward and just give us um, a closing prayer, and we do benediction and we can go home. I think there's a takeaway outside of food of those who are driving. Uh, Okay, whoever wants some takeaway because some people are still going somewhere else. But we can have something to take with if you feel like, or people that wants to engage maybe now or ask questions or the invitation is open even us as a team to say we are available to come and help you in your own circuit or you can group yourself with other neighboring circuits 
then you have a bit of a space or numbers, then we can do more discussion around this. It is an, an going, it's not ending today. Um, Fundisun Gomo, as you come forward, just to close it up for us. And we really thank you. We want to uh, thank the presiding bishop with the vision that he has given us and challenging us to say how to move forward. Thank you all for being here. And may God travel with you safely, getting home. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have been kind to us when we begin this meeting this morning. Thank you for guiding us so wisely. And now, Father, I want to ask you to be with us and to bless us graciously. All that we do, Lord, we do it for you. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. To say the grace in our own languages, we can stand and say the grace in our own languages. The grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, Lord, 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 the Holy Spirit be with us all night. Thank you. Travel safely. God be with you. Abandu Basa South Rand.